I'm very excited about this about this coming uh, panel. So first of all, truly really honored to have uh, Eric uh, Hilgendorf here. Um, so Professor Hilgendorf, so Eric is um, the chair of Department of Criminal Law, Criminal Procedure, Legal Theory, Information and Computer Science and Law at the University of Würzburg. Um, it, it is really no exaggeration to say that um, he is the, the leading scholar, uh, in my opinion, on law and technology, at least in Germany, if not you know, in one of the leading scholars in, in Europe and in, in the world. And we've been uh, uh, interacting for, for quite some time, and I'm really honored to have you be able to present here today. Um, has training in both uh, law and in philosophy. Um, then we have like, I, was, I, I, I get so used to calling you uh, rising stars, but that is just strike the rising. We have two of the absolute top stars in, in law and technology here um, to, uh, who are presenting both uh, fascinating papers. Um, and so, and that is of course, uh, Margot Kaminsky, you've heard a little bit from her already and Kristen Thomason, um, who's at the Allard School of Law at UBC. So our neighbor up to the north um, and, uh, and uh, uh, two people that I, that I learned um, uh, some, of the, some of the most stuff I've, I've, I've learned about robotics law and AI I've learned from, from these two scholars. Um, and so just, just as normal, um, uh, Eric's gonna give some uh, opening remarks consisting of uh, short summaries of the work. Uh, going to give some um, uh, remarks about about both papers uh, and maybe put them in conversation. Uh, then we're going to get a, a brief response. Uh, please let's keep it brief for, for timing's sake um, from Margot um, and from uh, No, no, I don't mean especially Margot. I don't don't hear me saying especially Margot, uh, but and, and from Kristen, um, the very succinct Kristen Thomason. Um, right. <laughs> so with that, uh, thanks for your patience about the about the catering stuff. And with that, I'm going to turn it all over to Eric. Thank you so much, Eric. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me. You, you all can hear that English is not my native language, and uh, over the last years, I had much opportunity to talk English. So if uh, anybody does not understand me, please. Raise your hand and I will repeat what, what I was trying to say. Um, and you saw me just blushing when Ryan was so friendly with in his remarks. I uh, exaggerated a bit, but nevertheless, I, I have work, been working a lot of on, in, on AI and I've been in the think tank that uh, uh, formulated the draft of this AI regulation that uh, Margot is now uh, going to, um, to, to give you more information on. So I prepared uh, a long commentary here, but since Ryan told me to be short, I will put it aside and try to speak <laughs> without uh, a, a, a longer written basis. So let's begin with um, uh, Margot's uh, paper. She was, has been introduced already. She's an associate professor of law at Colorado Law School, and uh, she's uh, analyzing uh, the risk approach to AI. AI is getting more and more important all over the world, not only in the US, but also in Europe and also in Eastern Asia and China and Japan. Uh, and they are, everybody knows there are many aspects of AI that might prove dangerous. Um, therefore, they are, there's a need for regulation. One way to regulate AI is to choose a risk-based regulation. That's the way the European Union has um, uh, chosen, maybe without enough uh, um, uh, the, um, 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 uh, analysis. Margot Kaminsky analyzes the pros and cons of such a risk-based um, approach in great detail in her paper. The paper is quite long and very, very sophisticated. I liked it very much. I think it's an extremely important introduction for both American and European readers to this um, uh, topic. Um, in our group, it was called the High Level Expert Group on AI. We um, supported this risk based approach, but we never thought of leaving liability aside. And that would be um, the first aspect I want to comment on the idea to have just a risk based, risk -based uh, approach and not, um, um, in addition, uh, uh, possibilities of civil and criminal liability never came to our minds. And therefore, I totally agree with Margot's point that it's very important to look also at. Um, uh, liability. Another aspect that seems important to me is that the European approach uh, covers uh, big business as well. I think here in America, you are talking mostly about uh, uh, regulating the government and the uses of AI uh, by, by government, but what we had in mind was regulating big business. And to speak the truth, mostly American big 
a business because Chinese <laughs> Chinese big business is isn't relevant on the uh, on the uh, uh, European market. So that's a totally different perspective. And if you have a look at this AI regulation, you will see that um, the 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 uh, the wording often goes whoever puts AI on the market or uses uh, AI uh, is obliged to follow the, this, these rules. Yeah? So putting on the market and using, and uh, the, uh, a company will put this AI on the market, bring it on the market, and therefore um, it's, it's a regulation of, of the business, in, in, basically. And um, third point that seems relevant to me is that um, we, we don't not only have the old uh, uh, um, general data protection regulation, GDPR, that Margot is uh, also um, analyzing in, in detail, but we have also other new approaches like the Data Act, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act. It's like, an, I think the word is avalanche uh, of regulation coming from Europe now. I believe, and many colleagues believe, this is quite problematic because it's not quite clear how the how these uh, regulations will overlap and what, are, what will be the influences of one regulation to the other regulation for this. For example, there's a big big problem uh, regarding the relationship between the GDPR and the AI Act, but also um, a big big problems concerning the relationship between the Data Act and um, the um, um, uh, AI regulation. When the AI regulation will come into force is yet open uh, according to what I know they plan to, do, to bring it to, to put it into force in um, next April, but probably it will take a lot more time and I will do all I can to um, uh, uh, to bring Margot's paper to their knowledge uh, so they have to <laughs> they have to rethink uh, uh, many parts of uh, what, what, what they've done. I could say much more, but I will stop at this. The, the next next paper I have the um, honor to, uh, to to introduce is uh, the paper of um, my colleague Kristen Thomasen. She's also assistant professor at Peter Allard School of Law, University of British Columbia. I had the chance to invite her a couple of years ago to a conference in Munich, where she gave a wonderful presentation on drones. Um, today, the paper we are going to talk about is uh, entitled Safety First, Paradoxes in Canadian Robotics and, um, uh, and AI Governance. And the main point, I think, is that um, safety is a problematic concept because there are questions like safety for whom? Safety for the general public or safety for a majority group or safety only for a few privileged persons. And the second point with safety is safety can mean uh, safety from dangerous entities. And the answer would be incarcerate them, take them away, bring them to take them to prison. Yeah, that's what she is criticizing. Another aspect of uh, safety would be as, uh, safety, meaning feeling of well-being, a feeling of harmony within the group. And the, the, to be free of the risk of attack is only one aspect of safety in this positive uh, sense. And uh, uh, Kristen is arguing that we need to have this positive perspective on safety when regulating an um, AI. Yeah. And I totally agree with this. Maybe this visit to Munich has imparted some European ideas uh, to her, <laughs> yeah, because this approach to safety, yeah, not incarceration, but something positive is what we think is uh, uh, the, the normal approach, uh, the standard approach in, in Germany the incarceration enthusiasm in the US is something we think is problematic now yeah, without being critical. Yeah, it's, there's too much incarceration here in the, the US and in, in Germany, the incarcer incarceration rate, I think in all over Europe, the incarceration quotas are going down because experience shows that people that have been incarcerated are even more dangerous when they come out uh, and pose a lot of uh, problems. Yeah. Therefore, I, I will say, I totally agree with Kristen's um, uh, a paper, and I will leave it with that, I think, and uh, stop here if it's okay for you. And now we are expecting your questions or maybe first your answers. So extremely succinct, Margot Kaminsky <laughs> is going to say, uh, it's an honor to be on this panel with both of these people. Um, 
I, I think I want to just reiterate that Eric's work in the EU is extremely important, and this is an opportunity to actually have a conversation with somebody who's involved in the creation and refinement of one of the more important regulatory regimes or models for artificial intelligence law. Um, and Kristen's work, uh, you know, when I, I read it, thinking about it through the framework of my paper is another step in conversations about the extent to which the harms of AI should or can be quantifiable. Um, and I think I was talking about this a little bit with Andrew in the hallway like 25 minutes ago, um, <laughs> that, that the, one of the hardest things about trying to use risk regulation to govern artificial intelligence is that many of the risks that we're trying to govern are things that are both not quantifiable and are highly contested. So we think about discrimination or anti-discrimination or fairness um, or uh, even privacy, right? Or safety. Um, I think we default to thinking, of, I think default frequently to thinking about safety as something that's easy to measure and therefore easy to mitigate against uh, safety harms. And Kristen's paper really made me think like, nope, it's all contestable all the way down. <laughs> so that's succinct tomorrow. I echo everything Margot said about being so honored to be on the panel with both of you. Thank you so much, Eric, for reading our papers and for your comments. And Margot, I feel like our papers are in such a nice conversation, which is amazing because I think this panel was probably scheduled before our papers were submitted. So it was like prescient on the part of scheduling. Well done, Ryan. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think there's something, like I read your paper after I had finished and submitted my paper. And I just loved in reading Margot's paper about how we can identify so many assumptions in what regulators are doing that when unquestioned can lead to considerably negative outcomes that if we don't place the approach to regulation in historical context and in an honest context of the ways in which our current context is incredibly inequitable um, and there are many systems of oppression at play that are reified by regulation and by the use of AI and robotics, we don't incorporate that into the conversation. We're just going to end up perpetuating everything that we're talking about as being problematic with these technologies. And I just thought it was so nice how we're in conversation about these hidden, quote unquote, I mean, I think a lot of people recognize them, un unheard assumptions on the part of regulators um, and how we're approaching regulation on these issues. So, yeah. So if, if, uh, I don't exactly know the task of a, of a moderator in America, but in Europe, a moderator would now start to moderate. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, my, my, my first task would be to ask you to ask you to ask questions. Yes, someone yeah. should, should uh, pose the first question, please. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take uh, whatever chair privilege or whatever you call it. Um, uh, one of the many privileges that I enjoy, uh, I guess. Uh, but um, so I'm just gonna just gonna comment um, on both papers, if I may. And you know, um, you know, Eric, again, especially given the fact that you have um, substantively contributed so um, deeply to uh, uh, the the risk assessment framework that the EU is is poised to deploy here, uh, please don't hesitate also to answer these questions. Um, Margo, I, you know, Margo, Margo, Margo. So, um, so this is so. So, so I, I, I am, I am usually in, in, in. Um, every time I read a paper of yours, I feel simultaneously like this is just brilliant, and it just, and it just, I just learn so much, and I rethink. You know what I mean? But sometimes our intuitions are, are are different about some of these key questions, which is why I just love you as an interlocutor. You know what I mean? And so here's another one. Here's another one, just like that. So just like we might go back and forth about, you know, determinism and, and such, you know, all these different things. Like, I just, I just, uh, I just want to hear what you think in reaction to this. So for me, the dichotomy is not between um, the precautionary principle and risk assessment. For me, the precautionary principle is an extreme form of risk assessment that says that in some instances, when there is risk, the risk is too great and you need to prove that that you have harm mitigation strategies in place or that you won't cause the harms we're worried about and hence you do not deploy it. So I was uh, you know, surprised, frankly, is the word to see you put those two as being counterposed in your paper. So to me, it's precaution, just like what you say, German environmental law in the 70s, like, yeah, 
um, as against the, say, American libertarian model of uh, permission, right? Where the people who are advocates of permission or, or some, sometimes permissionless innovation say, look, when there's a harm, we'll, we'll deal with it. But until there's a harm, like, we, you know, just let people do what they're going to do. Innovation is really important. They're going to save lives. Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And so that's the classic dichotomy to me. Um, and so uh, uh, risk assessment is not harm reduction. You, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it, it, you know, the, the idea of harm mitigation is the idea that you do not intervene in the market and innovation and whatever you want to the fancy word you want to call it unless or until there's evidence of harm, right? So, so, so that's the, the first part of this. And the second part of this is, it seemed to me that your quibble in this paper and also, Kristen, your quibble, and not quibble, your, your, both of your deep critiques, I should say, excuse me, quibble is the wrong word. Both of your deep critiques seem to resonate in longstanding conversations about the problem with cost-benefit analysis. You know, so I was asking myself, like, where's the, um, you know, Lisa uh, Heinzerling, for example, right? And, and so talk about incomparability. Like, she has this great example about Say you're a prison system and you're told to do a cost benefit analysis and what you're aiming at is trying to reduce the likely of, likelihood of sexual assault. And so on one side of the ledger, you put all the extra staff it's going to take and all the technology and all these other things, right? But on the other side of the ledger, what do you put? You know, I mean, what kind of, what kind of comparison is that? It's, 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 you know, it's just nonsensical, you know? And so you're, you're back and forth about dignity with, uh, you know, uh, Nicholson, it, it's just, it, it's just, you know, it, it, it seems to me that like there's a, there's a critique lurking here of cost benefit. Um, and then, uh, uh, Kristen, for yours, I, I would say something similar too. that, like, that this is in, in a sense, it's like, it's not just the idea of safety. It's also deeply the notion that, that, that some of the things that ought to be included in a holistic, you know, real full consideration of safety are not so legible and, and they're not so quantifiable. And, and, and hence, you know, no matter how much you expand the definition, if what you're doing is cost benefit analysis, you're gonna run into these same kinds of, kinds of issues. Um, and so, I don't know, if, if, any, if all and any of you would like to react to that, I'm sorry for being long-winded, uh, but I loved these projects and I just, I learned a ton and uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I think, well, my first reaction to your great comments, and I'm going to think more on this, so this is just sort of like an impromptu reaction, is that I think that some of these things are legible. It's that the people in positions of power to bring them into fruition don't want to listen or aren't listening for whatever reason, um, maybe because of a perceived limited role. Like I'm imagining like an airspace regulator being like, well, we don't, like it's not our position to listen to, you know, concerns about harassment because that's something else. Leave that to the criminal space or something like that, right? Like it could be because of a, a self-perception, like an institutional self-perception on the role or because of like just overtly not listening to the problem. Like I'm thinking more in the context of policing with facial recognition systems and like, you know, anyone could have told you before you adopted Clearview AI that this was not a good idea but you chose not to engage. And in fact, in Canada, the, the, this was clearly revealed that we're not going to engage um, in a conversation with the public and we're going to hide that back by not even telling the public that we're using the system in the first place. So I think like the answers are there. It's that the government structures don't want to find them or haven't thought that it's their responsibility to find them. And I wanted to critique that assumption as being, I think, quite frankly, wrong and is gonna lead them to fail in their objectives. Um, but on the cost benefit analysis, it's a really interesting that you say that. I'm gonna have to think more on it because in my mind, like the cost benefit kind of economic approach is what we see happening in this sort of like horse roll or eliminatory view of public safety. Um, I don't see that as being sort of the basis or fundamental of these more comprehensive visions because there isn't a cost. Like if we can bring, lift up everyone together, it's all benefit all the way down. Um, you know, costs aren't perceived as economic costs if it's actually making us all better off. So I, I'm gonna have to think more on that, but I appreciate that comment because yeah, I, I just 
I don't see that coming out. And so I'm gonna to have to think because obviously it is. And so I'm gonna to have to think about that more. Thank you. Um, so thank you, succinct Ryan Pillow. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, cost benefit analysis is hugely problematic, especially if you are applying it to things that cannot be quantified. Um, 100% my normative priors, right? Uh, doing human rights through impact analysis is potentially really challenging because of exactly that, because it's going to get weighed against something and the thing it's gonna get weighed against will be much easier to construct through the institutions and the procedures and the technologies that are used to, to conduct impact assessments than the human rights you know, will be. Um, and I think that's the, the central challenge for the European framework and the place where I'm most excited to see how it plays out. Um, I'm highly skeptical of it being possible to do that, to, to risk mitigate on human rights without one having, as Eric mentioned, um, mechanisms for affected individuals on an individual level to challenge outcomes. So that's the whole right to contest line of research um, and uh, without having an effective mechanism for bringing affected communities in into the conversation, which I think really resonates with what Kristen is doing. Um, you know, you can't, you can't just have a risk mitigation approach that is entirely internal to a company that is, you know, entirely channeled through sort of internal processes. I think almost everybody agrees on this. Uh, it, and rely on those internal processes to effectively capture the interests of people whose human rights have been threatened. None of that is new. Um, to the, the like, where, what is my sort of logic flow around precautionary principle versus risk mitigation? I had to understand that uh, what I was trying to communicate, but I definitely can work on this in the draft and I'd like to hear your feedback on this. So I don't know if this is requesting a response. Um, what I was trying to communicate was that there's step one of this sort of imaginary regulators decision tree is we're going to do risks instead of harms, right? We're going to talk about prognosticating uh, and thinking about things that are not yet realized on a systemic level. Think about it, you know, with the trade-offs of society writ large as the framework, as opposed to looking at individuals who are impacted and we're going to deal with future and there's going to be causation problems like that's what we're going to do, not harms, risks. Uh, and then the second question is, you know, where in the decision tree do we go? Do we go uh, precautionary principle or do we go more American style cost benefit analysis measure, look for and mitigate the harms? I didn't mean to imply that those were either or. I think there's some really great work out there, including uh, David Vogel's work that suggests that they're, and Kaiser's work to some extent too, that suggests they're really on a spectrum. So you can find precautionary elements in US law and you can find you know, cost benefit uh, mitigation elements in European law. Um, so to the extent that that looked like I was charting a, an either or, I need to fix that in the draft. Uh, she's next in August. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Sue Gluck from Microsoft. Uh, I have to say I'm loving this trend of picking on the succinct Ryan Kahlo who we have learned is a poor credit risk and potentially gonna be murdered by his bestie. So uh, yeah, this is, I'm having a great day. Thank you. Uh, I, I loved both your papers. I thought my feedback actually was just gonna be for Kristen because Margot, you already had a turn, come on. But, um, but then thinking about cost benefit analysis, I have a little something uh, for both of you and that is, and I'm because I just thought of this standing behind Ryan as he was speaking. Um, I'm not sure there's a paper I can point you to, but Barry Friedman, of the uh, uh, pro at professor at NYU Law, in his policing project work, uh, uses cost benefit analysis and amazingly, like as a counterpoint to to the reference that that Ryan gave, um, he actually can talk about quantifying things that are fairly horrible in monetary terms in this sort of magical way. And so if there is no work I can point you to and I'll look, um, I would suggest a conversation and I'm happy to make uh, introductions and stuff. Um, love both your papers, by the way, I skipped that part. I was 
so eager to jump on the Ryan Kalo bandwagon. Um, but the rest of my feedback is is for Kristen. Um, so uh, the loved your paper, loved that you um, started with the safety paradoxes. A, a, a lot of times people start with definitions and rightfully so, but you drew the reader in with the paradoxes. And I think that was an excellent way to proceed. Um, and the part where you're talking about the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, I was thinking you, I don't think you have to do this, but I think you might enjoy reading, if you haven't, Cory Doctorow's um, dystopian youth fiction, uh, um, Little Brother and Homeland, because it's that same kind of surveillance, one-sided, and, and what people with less powers do to fight back. So I don't know. I just thought you might find that inspirational. Um, you really got me thinking uh, about all the things in safety that I wasn't thinking about. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I started to wonder if you could do more to, so facial recognition use by the police is kind of a polarizing topic. And if you think about uh, the history of policing in the United States, where it began as chasing runaway slaves, not such a great history, not such a great outcome that we're seeing today with the use of facial recognition. But it's hard to persuade the people who benefit from thinking about safety in the old way and not in your new way with something that's as big like that. So I was wondering if maybe you might wanna go further in your discussion about, um, about drones and things. You point to your paper on drones and feminism, but you don't really discuss it through this safety angle. And I think that would be really helpful because it's not as polarizing a topic because I want you to convince people in power to think about safety in this way. And so I think it's helpful if you're not like the people you wanna convince, maybe a less threatening to them example, helps them to think about it and not just reject it out of hand. Um, and I love that towards the end of the paper, you talked about how Transport Canada does public education and they could do more in terms of community outreach. And I have some links to send you back to Barry Friedman, NYU Law. Um, the Policing Project has done amazing work in community outreach in Chicago between the police and communities that are probably over-policed and don't trust, obviously, the police. And they've done some really cool work and there are lots of reports and things uh, to read there. But overall, both papers excellent. Um, thanks for giving us entertaining and thought-provoking material. Thank you so much, Sue. I'll definitely take you up on those recommendations. Thank yeah. you. I just wanted to provide like maybe a place where Eric could contribute to this. My understanding is that cost-benefit analysis as it's used in Europe uh, is look, does look very different than it does in the United States. This is not my regulatory wheelhouse, um, but that there are places, there are examples of you know, calling on companies to do the analysis themselves to justify that they are not causing harm, right? Where cost-benefit analysis can be actually quite helpful if you just switch the regulatory burden. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to speak a little bit more to cost-benefit analysis and human rights. Yes, if, you, if you want me to, uh, me to add something, I would say that uh, this idea of cost-benefit analysis is relevant in, in, two, in two aspects in the, this AI um, uh, regulation or this proposed AI regulation. Uh, first, the regulator, the European Commission, um, 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 made a cost, ad, cost uh, uh, analysis and said there are certain types of risks that, we, we, that are banned totally. Then they said there are high risks, and then they said there are other risks we, we accept with a little bit of regulation. So what they did was a cost-benefit analysis um, um, as, a, as a regulator, and what they banned was mainly facial recognition systems, yeah, social scoring uh, of the type of, uh, of China, uh, and um, systems, AI systems that could reach the unconscious and uh, manipulate uh, uh, the unconscious. So these 
three types of AI systems were considered uh, so dangerous that, were, that they were banned in total. And then comes the second category of high-risk systems. It's, it's a long list. Um, to this list belong, for example, systems, um, uh, AI systems that are used for border control, border control in, in Europe, the direction of Africa or uh, the Arab world. Yeah? They are allowed, but there's a lot of regulation. Yeah? There's a lot of regulation in detail. For example, there has to be done a cost-benefit analysis for uh, every system, whether it's acceptable or if it could do more harm than, uh, than good. And uh, also what's interesting, legal tech is also considered a high risk system, use of AI systems in, in law. And they also have to be done uh, cost benefit analysis. And then the third and fourth category are AI systems that are considered not really dangerous and they have to be transparent. And you have to know when you are confronted with such a system, but more or less that's that's all. Uh, that's a that's a kind of risk approach by the European um, um, uh, Commission, and of course, it's debatable whether these um, uh, systems that are that were put into the uh, forbidden uh, category really belong there. Maybe there are some good in, in these systems. Yes, so you can also criticize this the, the cost benefit analysis the European Commission has has done. Thank you. Hi, I have a kind of an open-ended question for Margot, but anyone else can can respond. My, I'm Tim O'Brien, by the way. I'm with the Policy School here at UW, and uh, your paper makes multiple references to enforcement and enforceability with good reason. This is, I think, one of the lessons of GDPR that the best-intended regulation does, doesn't quite work if member states aren't on board, resources aren't there, etc. And in the context of DSA, just this week, one of the members of the European Parliament, I think, it was Crystal Schaldmose from Denmark says so something to the effect of people working in an enforcement capacity will get paid comparable salaries to what you could make at a tech company. And uh, I found out about this because like Daphne Keller knows probably as much about DSA as anybody in the US just tweeted it out. She hadn't heard it either. I wanted to get your reaction to that. Do you, do you, will you believe it when you see it? Or uh, is this like an intentional thing that has to happen in order to stop government from being having access to tech literacy undercut by the private sector saying, not so fast, I'll pay you more money, don't take that job. So I just love your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, you know, the conversation about enforcement and capacity and expertise and um, capture, all of those things I think are, are central to how laws that in theory can look great uh, in reality hit the road. Um, and I, I think that a solution that is geared at salaries as incentives to keep people out of the tech sector or draw people from the tech sector into uh, regulators' you know, arms uh, are great. And I don't, I don't think it's in any way sufficient, right? Um, I think a lot in my other work about uh, the role of information flows in checking regulatory agendas and so one of the concerns, you know, not thinking about DSA, but thinking about the GDPR model, one of the critiques that I've made of the GDPR is that, you know, it relies centrally on this a close friendly relationship between the regulator who has a big stick and the regulated company, an undercapacitied regulator with a big stick, but, but, you know, they have a big stick there, they've got big fines. Um, but it doesn't create adequate mechanisms in my view for oversight over that relationship between the regulator and the company. So just paying the regulator more doesn't make them less friendly with the company. Um, you need to have, and part of this is because, you know, Europe has a, um, a less robust tradition of civil society organizations. You know, the U.S. has a, a grand skepticism of regulation that leads to really big pushes for transparency and for public communication. Uh, but that's a piece of the puzzle that I think really needs to be addressed for regulators to be effective in enforcement. Uh, so I really enjoyed both of these papers, uh, Kristen. I, I'd love. I'm. I just. I'm standing here staring at this bottle that says "safety first" on it, and I, I, I just love how much you're complicated. Like as Margo said, it's an uncontroversial good thing, and you're just totally complicating it. And I love that. Um, at the end of the paper, I felt like in the last three sentences, I was totally whiplashed. Um, whereas the line is basically. For this stuff to work and be safety first, we need to fix inequality, which seems big. 
Um, and then, but can robots and AI help us do that? I don't know. Um, and I, I, I don't know where to go from there. And I'm curious if there's like a next paper coming, like here's what we, or, or if you have thoughts, I'm super curious about that. Um, Margo, I have two questions for you. One in the spirit of uh, co-authorial vengeance. Um, have you considered uh, entirely inverting the paper? Um, <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is right now, it feels like this is a paper about AI and section two is saying, by the way, here are some really big thoughts on risk regulation, four different forms, the baggage that comes with them, what happens when you do this. I don't know the risk regulation literature enough, but it sure feels like you're plowing some new ground there. And I'm curious as to whether or not that will be hidden from the people that aren't awesome AI people because they're not gonna read a paper about regulating AI. And so this, should this be a paper that says like risk regulation, different models and like baggage that comes with it and AI is your principal example, which haha, I don't have to do it, but like there's a suggestion you might wanna consider. Um, the second point I'll ask is like, you talk mostly about big transcontextual regimes, which someone, I don't remember who, pointed out can be problematic. Um, uh, the one that leaps to my mind when you're like, oh man, risk regulators, they don't do this stuff. And I look at FDA and I'm like, wow, they've got a licensure regime in terms of AI uh, algorithms. They've got post-market surveillance that's required. They've got good machine learning practices, which certainly feels a lot like fair machine learning practices uh, in advance. Like it feels like they're actually deploying a bunch of the tools that you're talking about. Uh, and I'm curious as to, well, what you make of that. Uh, that's all I got. Thanks, that's worth it. Um, I freaking love that there's a safety first hand sanitizer <laughs> up there. Is that what you mean? The, okay. Because I mean, that fits, right? Like the idea that the public can be narrowly or broadly conceived fits exactly with like our public health measures of using hand sanitizer and wearing masks to keep each other safe. Um, because yeah. in our minds, the public includes the immune compromised and in other places like a lot of policies in Vancouver that is no longer the case and the public does not include the immune compromise among others. So, I mean, it's perfect. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and it fits with what I'm talking about in the paper, even though obviously I'm not necessarily talking about COVID policies. This idea of who is the public is, is sort of central to identifying some of these safety paradoxes. Um, but to answer your question about whether I have an answer to the last question, I like, I know maybe it's a bit of a cop out because I got to the end and I'm like, I honestly just don't know anymore. Like how this fits. And so this is not a fulsome answer, but just like an initial answer, like even thinking about the no dapple example, where we see the use of drones can be done, like drones can be used for the purpose of in enhancing safety. But the only reason those drones need to be used for the purpose of enhancing safety is because you have violent policing and you have colonial policies, colonial and capitalist policies aimed at putting a, an oil pipeline through indigenous land against the consent of the community. Um, so if we took away those two things, then we don't need the drones for safety anymore. And so that's where it becomes like, like, I guess I'm stuck on like chicken or the egg, like do, AI and robotic tools that allow for, for instance, like when we think about like what's different about AI robotics, like in that case, drones allowed for a separation of the operator from the video camera, which meant it also protected the operator's safety from, you know, uh, rubber bullets and cold water in the middle of a November night, et cetera. Um, you know, do we promote the ability to use tools in these sort of disruptive ways because they can enhance safety or do we, actually get rid of the thing that's threatening safety in the first place, um, which is a much, much more enormous task. So maybe in the short term, it's actually a lot easier to say, you know, we shouldn't be paradoxically limiting the use of drones by one group and not by the other in the name of safety when it actually makes the limited group less safe. Um, but I like, to me, that doesn't feel like a very fulfilling answer. <laughs> um, so I'm stuck on that to be quite honest. And that's why I left it out as an open-ended question because I honestly just don't have, it's like frustrating to me to not be able to answer that question. And and I just, yeah, I'm kind of stuck there. But I agree with you. I Maybe I'd leave it as a bit of like building towards an ending and then I'm just gonna leave you with a giant question that I can't answer. Um, so uh, 
if you want to co-author again, we should write the piece about FDA. Uh, and <laughs> the other one, the other example that I wanted to look at was financial risk regulation, because it's really interesting and really hard. And I have an RA working on it, and I just did not have the capacity to get it into this paper. Um, then to your question about like flipping the framing, uh, I'd love to talk to risk regulation scholars. And I'd love for that to be, if not this project, then a kickoff project from this. In this paper in particular, the motivation was really, um, and he's not in the room right now, so I can call him out. Uh, the motivation was really the, the impact assessment conversation that Andrews uh, Seltz is very much part of, uh, Ben is very much part of, there's like a lot of people in this room very much part of. Um, and and uh, to say, oh, hi, Andrew, you are in the room. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, you know, and to say like when we're, in some ways it's similar to the human in the loop project, would say when we're just focusing on this narrow regulatory intervention, we are missing forest for trees. An impact assessment is a, a one very, very micro part of what's overall a risk regulation approach. And to just get stuck thinking about the impact assessment um, is to to uh, to leave out other possible interventions that could be necessary for the impact assessment to succeed, um, but also historically have been ways that we framed risk regulation that that have actually been you know arguably more precautionary, arguably more successful. Um, so I want to be speaking to that community and to this community, um, but I agree that there is there is a potential conversation with the larger risk regulation community that I'm a little afraid to take on because I don't know much about FDA. Hi, um, first of all, thank you all for your conversation on the panel. It's been extremely useful. I'm Bargavi and I'm from the University of Edinburgh where I'm currently working on my PhD. Um, this paper, Margot, that you wrote is very, very relevant to everything I'm studying. So I wish I'd read it maybe six months earlier, but um, it's been- It wasn't written six months earlier. So okay, well, <laughs> that's that's the trouble, I guess, in this area. Um, but I was going to say, one area that really confused me, and I'm newer to this um, work, so maybe I'm missing something here. But when you talk about these different types of classifications, you say that they're in conflict with one another, and it's not always apparent to me what the conflict is, first of all, and second of all, why that conflict matters. So for, for one example, I would say, you mentioned that enterprise risk management would come uh, run counter to a democratic accountability model, but there was no real citation for why that would be the case. And I was wondering if you had any real like, um, you know, like empirical evidence or other types of evidence to uh, back that claim up. Um, and then my second question, which is open to the panel in general, is around this framework uh, in the EU of the risk management framework of these different risk levels. I wanted to understand if you thought at all about the perverse market incentives of being in a lower risk category and potentially feeling like you had more uh, leeway to do more and then you could move to another risk um, profile pretty quickly. And, and the examples I think of are in financial regulation, which is my prior um, area of focus, which is you have these non-bank shadow lenders who are now almost more than 50% of the market. And that is largely driven by these regulations that were focused on banks. And so this is something that I'm really interested in. Thank you. That's fascinating. I mean, uh, Nicholson and I have co-authored in the past on shadow health data, which is a really similar sort of scenario where you have institutions trying to route around regulation uh, because they don't want to fall into the higher risk, well, it's not even the risk bucket, the regulated bucket. Um, to, uh, to answer your question about specifically about enterprise risk management versus the democratic accountability model. So I think, uh, hi, Andrew, that this is the conflict over impact assessments in a nutshell, which is that you have um, Regulators thinking about them frequently as being about enterprise risk management. It's to harness internal organizations and professionals in a uh, in a company um, to get them to prevent risks from actualizing and to mitigate them. And the idea is, if you have full transparency into that, uh, you're going to disrupt um, flows of information by good faith uh, companies to the regulators because there is going to be a chilling effect if they disclose. I'm not saying I espouse this, but this is how the conversation goes. Um, they're going to disclose information to the regulators. It's going to go to the public. The NGOs are going to get upset. And so you're going to have a chilling effect. The companies are no longer going to disclose the information accurately to the regulators. Uh, and they might do less internal risk mitigation. Think, for example, about the leaks about Facebook and the impact of social media on uh, teenagers 
that a company would be disincentivized from conducting exactly that kind of analysis if they know it's going to go public and then the public's going to get really mad about it. Um, versus the democratic accountability model, which is more of the NEPA model, which is to say an environmental impact assessment, if it's about anything, is in large part about letting the public know this is happening um, and getting democratic feedback. Uh, and those two, the, the sort of goals and mechanisms of each of those models can result in conflicting policy choices specifically around transparency and disclosure. Great, thank you, that's helpful. Hi, um, I'm Maria Angel. I'm doing my PhD here at the University of Washington. Um, and my comment is about Margot's paper. So first, Margot, I'm really happy to see your theoretical contribution. I'm also working on SDS, so I'm really happy to see that you are using the legal construction of technology. And I loved your, your question, the question of what does it mean to legally construct the harms of AI as risks? Actually, publicly here, I'm gonna say that I'm trying to use your example as a model to formulate my own research question. But I'm wondering about the answers you give to this question. Because basically in your introduction, you tell us that basically choosing the risk regulation approach will first change how the social practices of AI are read in the, into the legal system. Second, construct the meaning of AI harms. And third, construct the meaning of AI systems. And I'm pretty sure that we all noticed how you showed how, how the meaning of AI risks change with this new approach. Also, we saw how this new approach um, drives policymakers to, for example, render invisible some type of, of harms of some type of populations that are being affected. But the third part, the one of how did the meaning of AI systems change is not that clear to me. So maybe I missed something, but given that I'm trying to do something similar, I really wanna piggyback on what you're doing. So I would really encourage you to tell us a little bit more here or in the paper better um, about how the concept, the meaning of AI systems changes based on this new approach. Thank you. I have no idea what I meant by that. <laughs> um, you know, I think what I was trying to think of was that uh, when you have the technology and it's being constructed through the law and the legal system, that the techno meaning of the technology changes. And I think it was a throwaway sentence and not intended to be something I'd prove in the paper. Um, but uh, I will think much more about how to illustrate that in the paper or whether it's just to take the sentence out. Maybe. Maybe at this point I can say something to this concept of um, AI system. We had a, a similar discussion about that uh, in, in Germany um, concerning autonomous cars. As, as you maybe know, there has been a new law on autonomous cars in Germany in summer 2017, and then again in summer 2021. And this um, um, regulation in summer 2021 is a um, um, regulation for totally autonomous cars, cars without, without a driver, so technical version level four, level five. Um, and I was in contact with the Ministry of Transportation and um, as I, I asked them whether this was meant as a regulation of AI. And they said, no, it has nothing to do with AI. It's about autonomous cars. And then I, I asked, what, what's the difference between autonomous systems in cars and AI? And they answered me, AI means this, the systems are able to learn. They are changing their own programming by, by information from the outside, they are learning. And in the, in the draft version of this German regulation, there was indeed a paragraph on self-learning uh, AI and it's run basically, or the, the message was basically that the, the systems were allowed to learn on the street, but um, what they learned was not to be put into practice at once, but had to be submitted to the ministry. Some ex ministry experts would analyze it, and only after giving the green light, uh, that this, this new information that has had been learned should be, should be used. And this somehow seemed too hot for the parliament. They did not dare to, to, uh, to introduce this, so they left it out uh, totally. So we have a regulation on level four and level five cars, but according to the German Ministry of Transportation, no regulation on um, um, AI systems. And this is a bit strange because of the normal understanding of autonomous systems and AI, mean, this means more or less the same. 
Hello, I'm uh, Michael Kohlein from the German <clears throat> Research Institute of Public Administration. First of all, it's nice to see you, Professor Hilgendorf, because I was at a conference 2008 in Istanbul. I was an exchange student, and somehow the first time I saw you there, and it was the only German law professor I knew talking about robotics. And now, so many years later, I see you here. I didn't even know you at this conference, uh, so you always meet twice, I guess. And also now working on these uh, topics. I have uh, just a small um, comment to Kirsten, um, just uh, to give the you know perspective of uh, German administrative law. We have always have the differentiation we discern between public safety and public order. By public safety, meaning more something structured by legal rules and public order being more open for ethical or like sociological considerations. And uh, maybe it might be interesting to look in this concept of public order, because there's a lot of literature. It's very contested in police law and so on, but it might be interesting. And what also I found interesting about your paper was that you try to bring privacy into safety regulation. Uh, which is a very big test in medical devices regulation, but uh, also in many other fields. Um, and safety meaning basically the safety of a human being and the safety of the public. So this is also somehow connected. And it's interesting how these intertwine and how especially product uh, liability law is so much focused on safety of just the person, but not of the privacy or the personality and so on. And so these examples really helped me and uh, find interesting also what the public safety and the individual safety, how they somehow are connected. So this is something um, I found interesting about your paper. And uh, Margot, I would uh, um, find it very interesting your conclusions also. For me, I learned a lot about the US regulation going on, uh, working a lot with the AI Act. Um, and at the end, you talked that design requirements or substantive requirements could be a way uh, to go and um, just want to point to the instrument of harmonized standards that you also mentioned in, in the paper about the AI Act and just want to explain how, in my view, I think it's a very interesting instrument that uh, technical standardization is not just a way for the industry to improve their supply chains or to work better together, but it's really a, a way of specifying the law. Uh, or legal requirements. So we have for high risk AI, we have like all these things, human in the loop, you talked about it before also, oversight. And the question is now, how do we get these abstract things into practice for AI systems, which are by nature um, less researched and, and broader than for example, a, a nuclear power plant or an airplane, the thing that you used in, in human in the loop. So, but the technical specifications and uh, using them basically to get these design requirements, not only generally for AI systems, but also in different sectors, this would be something might uh, enrich your paper, I think, to kind of connecting your yeah, conclusion beneath these design requirements and looking at is this tool or this method of harmonized standards, uh, how can we make that really work to bring the legal and the computer science uh, parts together and really say this is in the law and this is how you actually implement it in your AI product. And I find it quite promising, but you seemed a little bit more critical about it. So I would like to know, uh, you know, what your view is on these harmonized standards, if you have one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll definitely look at that distinction. That's really interesting. And, and I can see how that would be really helpful. And I just want to say, like, I, I don't even feel like my paper is like me arguing. It's like a, a bibliography of a whole bunch of other brilliant people is what it feels like to me anyway. Um, and so on this like privacy as being part of safety, I just want to give a shout out to Michael Frumkin, who I know is watching, who's co-authored a, a great piece, um, really elaborating that argument. But there's also so many other authors who are cited in that paper and even beyond um, who've come up with these comprehensive visions that that I'm just trying to piece together into the into relationship with AI and robotics regulation. But thank you very much. Yeah, uh, just a brief point about the uh, filling in the gaps of the law through standard setting organizations. Everything old is new again. Uh, these are conversations about you know, various um, technical governing bodies and in the internet that have been happening since the beginning of internet law. Uh, and one of my deep concerns, which is not a new concern, is that when you shunt effectively normative decisions to what's supposed to be a technical body, um, you're closing off the avenues of participation that we're normally you know, would be engaging in a public regulatory process. Um, and that can have significant consequences, especially when you then have the technical standard in, you know, 
embodying normative decisions, uh, but being deferred to by regulators and by companies as being a non-normative technical specification. Okay, well, um, since I'm not here for Margo, I only have one question. I don't know if Christian for Christian. Um, actually, uh, yeah, Margo, I realize I need to read your paper. <laughs> but yeah, you write too much, so apparently I'm called out on it. Um, anyway, uh, we'll talk later. Um, yeah, so uh, for Kristen, I wanted to, uh, I sort of mentioned this to you uh, very briefly yesterday, but I was very surprised to learn that there's a whole community of people talking about AI that have co-opted the safety term to mean like, the, the long-termists, right? They all talk about AI safety and mean a totally different thing than anyone else talking about safety, even when they're talking about, I don't know, physical safety from cars or as you're talking about carceral safety. And I wonder if it's worth considering like expanding the definition of safety to include all these things and sort of take them down in a similar way. Because I think there are people in the sort of fact aligned space that are very upset um, at this idea of calling safety or calling this thing AI safety, partially because uh, it's, it's along the same kinds of critique I think that you're making, which is that to think of this as safety of the of the you know existential risk is is not necessarily directly um, adversarial to um, to uh, at-risk communities like a carceral view is, but it's at the very least very, very privileged um, to ignore you know, everything going on in the, in the world right now for some future risk. And there are people saying like to call this safety is to co-op the very real existing safety risks of AI. And I was trying to scour my brain for a paper that says that. And all I can come up with was, I, I recently wrote a paper with uh, Deb Raji who rants about this. And so it's just her voice is flooding through my head. I don't know if she's actually written on this or just tweeted about it, but somebody I think has. And so there's there's um, maybe room to open up your like, what is safety discussion to critique, you know, more just generally privileged ideas of what safety is that don't take into account um as expansive a version of what safety is so i don't know and uh, to the extent though that you're talking about existing canadian law it may not make sense that may be more of a footnote so i don't know i just wanted to flag it because i remember i was at least shocked that this was such a broad term for oh, for this existential risk idea i just had no idea that people accepted this idea as ai safety which is just weird to me yeah, thank you. And in fact, as you're speaking, I can like envision the paragraph that needs to expand. Well, maybe more than a paragraph, but like I can specifically envision at least one paragraph that could incorporate um, what you're saying exactly, which is like also, and maybe this goes back to Sue's earlier point as well, but like even just the idea that like, like there is still a safety for some, oh, there's safety for some dimension um, in this like limited, narrow, inequitable view of safety where like those some are are in in many ways in many very many ways in some cases privileged over the many who lose safety because we're privileging certain kinds of safety or certain people's safety um and so i think that that like i'll talk to you more maybe offline yeah. but i i would love to sort of expand on that in right. a paper. One, one big thing is that funding right um, for that same funding could very well be funding for as well there is a direct, like, what is the research funding that to then sort of make this a zero sum thing? No, for sure. And maybe that even goes back to like cost benefits, like thinking about cost benefits in a way too, like the economics of how tools are being created and then regulated or used by governments um, is like, is relevant to how the background of thinking about what does it mean to create safety is being constructed. Well, I, I just yeah. want to, just a, sorry, Larry, if I may, just one quick um, two finger on this. So the other thing, question I had about the paper had to do with um, when you're when you're building a robot individually and you're thinking about the concept of safety, um, we, we're going to see in these demos, like all these safety measures built into spot and other, other things that are about physical safety, right? And as you start to onboard other things like privacy, security, um, the kind of safety we mean when we created a code of conduct this year for the first year, you know what I mean? Like a safety you know, safety, psychological, emotional safety, right? Um, well, there, there begins to kind of be trade-offs, right? And so if you're like, how much time do you have to spend at Boston Dynamic 
building a system that's not going to turn in conscious in a hundred years and kill everybody. You know what I mean? And like, however much time you spend on that, are you spending it on the other things about, you know, protecting marginal communities, protecting people's psychological safety, et cetera. Um, and so those, those trade-offs also, I think, play out at the individual design stage, but I, I, I jumped in front of, in front of, uh, can I real, real yeah, quickly of course, comment yeah, on that? Means, I, I yeah. was like waiting for that question to, or that point to come up because mm. I like, I don't think I addressed it explicitly in the paper, but I have been thinking about it, which is like the audience of this, but I don't, anyway, that's a more complicated thing, but the audience of this paper, what I can say is not like individual designers or companies that are designing the technologies, even though I think that this is relevant to that, it's actually governments that are intentionally or unintentionally manipulatively using the concept of public safety to create certain legal environments in which technologies are used. I think it gets far more complicated. So in that way, I take your, like, absolutely take your point. It gets far more complicated when we start thinking about this on the individual design level. And that's not this paper, but maybe to follow the truth, like someone should write that paper. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not this paper, because I think that that does get a lot more complex and, and needs a lot more nuance. This is really targeted at sort of the government legislative mindset that is behind some of the regulation. Perhaps a very short remark for me. In this high level group I, I mentioned, we also talked about this topic and we did not use uh, the, the, the term uh, safety because in Europe it's used um, um, as um, meaning a purely technical, technical safety opposed to security. And we often even use the English terms. We don't say Sicherheit, we say safety, safety and security. And this means something technical. And for for the, these problems, Kristen meant we in this high level group, we, 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 we use the term social robustness or trustworthiness. It was the same. So it's a kind of general acceptance and, and something that, uh, that that this new technology fits into society, but we didn't uh, 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 call it a safety problem, but a problem of acceptance and acceptability. That's so Last word. Uh, so just two suggestions. They're both about um, sort of conceptual clarity. One of them is very much related for, for uh, 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 Kristen, very much related to Eric's comment. So you might wanna just think more about what the concept of safety is. And it might be useful to think about a philosophical idea. So the word safety is what philosophers call a thick moral concept. That is safety is good, right? If you describe a situation as safe, if you describe an environment is safe, you're making a recommendation. So this is a concept that has both um, a, uh, uh, a descriptive component and a normative component. And they're, they're sort of mixed together. And just another conceptual idea about safety is um, frequently what happens in discussions of thick moral concepts is people want to deploy them for purposes Right. And so they are trying to move the concept to sort of have a different shape, different criteria for what constitutes true safety or onto a new topic where safety would not have been the appropriate word. So that's called metalinguistic uh, a negotiation or metalinguistic contestation. Right. We're trying to change the way the concept is used. We're trying to uh, change the criteria for the application of a concept because of the normative payoff associated with the understanding of the concept. Um, uh, so, uh, Margot, um, uh, the paper doesn't have any of the decision theory literature in it. Um, I think that might be helpful. So, the the a conventional way of thinking about this is the big concept is uncertainty, a lack of certainty. There are two kinds of uncertainty. One of them is called risk. That's quantifiable uncertainty, right? Where we can assign p-values, probability values. Then unfortunately, <coughs> the economists call the other kind of uncertainty, Knightian uncertainty. So we've got uncertainty and Knightian uncertainty, but another, another term that's used in the decision theory literature is ignorance. Right, so ignorance is where we can't, we don't have p-values. 
So just the standard result in decision theory is that under conditions of ignorance, there you just can't do anything like cost-benefit analysis. And there is no, there is sort of no uniquely rational procedure for dealing with cases of ignorance. Um, and that's where the precautionary principle comes in, right? We're dealing with a situation where we can't quantify, but we nonetheless need to act. So just, but the sort of the strict precautionary principle leads to all kinds of bizarre and irrational outcomes it, because almost always you can construct a risk, uh, excuse me, you can construct a, a worst case scenario on both sides, right? And so it just, it doesn't help at all. The, the recent literature on the precautionary principle is not actually about conditions of ignorance. What these are conditions of, pa of partial ignorance. So we know that there, what we believe is anyway, that there is a significant but non-quantifiable risk of this harm. And we think that the risks on the other side, which we can't quantify are much lower. So now those are cases actually that standard decision theory can handle. So all of that I think would be helpful because otherwise people are going to have this immediate reaction to your advocacy of the precautionary principle that you're advocating something that is demonstrably crazy, right? And I don't, I don't think that's what you're doing, but the 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 phrase precautionary principle sort of has morphed in meaning so so if all that were clear i think the conceptual structure of the paper would be clear thank you for that yeah thank you <laughs> well i i think we are at time and so this was a, a tremendous conversation thank you so much please join me in thanking of the panelists yeah. All right. And so what we have now is we have one hour. You have one hour. So come back at two o'clock, please. Check out all the demos. Get lunch. There should be more lunch uh, available out there for you. Uh, thank you for a great day so far. We'll see you in one hour at two o'clock. Thanks. OK, we're going to get started back up again. Um, Thank you all for for being punctual, notwithstanding the robot dog that is uh, that is wandering. I had to take I had to tell him to put that that dog away. You know, you got to put that dog away so we can continue on our day here. Um, no, but big thanks to um, to our colleagues across campus uh, in computer science and to Boston Dynamic for making that demo available and all the great demos from Amazon and other labs on on campus here. So uh, we really appreciate that a lot. Thank you and appreciate it. Um, all right, so I am very very excited to. Um, introduce our panel, uh, our final panel of the day. Um, and I'm gonna start with our moderator who is Ann Washington, um, the great Ann Washington. Um, so she, I'm sure you're um, familiar with her and her work. Um, in case you are not, she is really one of the pioneering uh, scholars um, in the area of uh, data science uh, for good and in um, uh, technology uh, in promotion of human flourishing. Uh, public interest technology is, I believe, the way that you frame it. But um, but but that's something that is in recent years, in particular, just become so central to how we think about law and technology and the role of the university. Um, so she's a data scientist uh, professor at NYU. Um, so thank you very much for doing the moderation. Um, and then we have uh, uh, a group of of really interesting um, scholars. So we have. Um, let me just get my, sorry. Um, so actually, uh, two out of the three of these individuals are PhD candidates, which we absolutely love to see. Uh, and so I'll start with, um, it's uh, Bargavi, did I get that correct? Gar Bargavi, you just told me, I'm sorry, Bargavi. So uh, Bargavi uh, Ganesh uh, from the University of Edinburgh, where she is a PhD candidate, uh, writing with colleagues Stuart Anderson and uh, Shannon Valor, who's well known to, to so many of us as being a leading um, ethicist of technology. Um, I don't. I don't think Shannon was able to make it to this particular event, um, but just saw her at AIES in Oxford um, for the the paper. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Steamboat accidents and their lessons for AI governance, which I'm very very excited about. Um, 
Next, we have uh, uh, Peter Henderson. Uh, you are a JD PhD in computer science at Stanford. Um, and uh, love the interdisciplinary. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful path you're taking. Writing with uh, Mark Crass, who is clerking and, and couldn't be here um, uh, as a federal ju judicial clerk. Um, but their paper is Algori algorithmic rulemaking versus algorithmic guidance. And then last and certainly not least, especially in the title department, um, we have uh, Tales from the Sausage Factory, three case studies on state legislation regarding robots uh, by Daniel Hinkle. Daniel is with the American Association for Justice, but just to make this very, very clear, he is appearing in his individual capacity uh, as a scholar and a person not on behalf of AAJ. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to your ABLE moderator and thank you again. And thank you for that lovely and warm introduction. Um, so uh, he said all the official things about me. I just like to say I'm a computer scientist who spent way uh, too much time in legislatures. So I, I, this is why I say that I play a lawyer on TV. Um, and we have three papers on governance, um, although there's more that ties them together than thinking about governance. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute. So uh, I'm just gonna say overall, we heard the titles and let me just tell you what they're generally about. And then I'm gonna talk about each one and then talk about how they're connected. So Henderson and Crass, Rulemaking and Guidance, first paper here. Um, it's really talking about this difference in administrative law when it's a rule or you're actually making guidance. And then the second paper um, that Daniel Hinkle is author on is talking about state legislative history. That's the sausage factory that's being referred to in the title. And uh, uh, then we have um, Bardigavi and Anderson and Valor. Um, and these are about lessons that we can learn from history, particularly from steamboat accidents. So let me take each one in turn and then start to tie everything together because there's some beautiful points of connection here. So in the first paper, algorithmic rulemaking, um, we talk about existing administrative law doctrine as it applies to decision, decision support tools. So administrative law distinguishes between rules and guidance. So rules are officially binding while guidance is not. Rules are subject to uh, the possibility of notice and consent, comment processes, part of the APA, Administrative Procedures Act. Um, and it also means plaintiffs and courts are allowed to uh, demand evidence and uh, agencies have to justify what they're doing. Where guidance is much harder to challenge in court. So you're not gonna have the same kind of uh, legal standard about this. Um, just to give you a hypothetical about how this works, imagine that you're an adjudicator who has a policy that has a means test. So if you have Z income, you're going to get Y benefit. An agency has these adjudicators, a human being, who goes out and normally does that based on the policy. Well, imagine that the adjudicator is making using a decision support tool. It's great. A lot of what I've studied are government systems and how they're efficient. So you efficiently can quickly determine whether someone is means tested, which is great. But what does that mean? Is the algorithm recommending the means test outcome? Is quote unquote recommending, which will have a, a legal uh, connotation? Or are the adjudicators relying on it in some way? Is there some penalty if they don't follow it? And so these are when you start to realize that there's this difference of trying to figure out whether it's a rule or a guidance when it comes to these automated systems. So they talk about several heuristics that have been used in court to determine if it functions as a rule or if it functions as a guidance. So this is a functional approach to understanding it. Some ways that they could think about it is, um, are the automated systems a signal to somebody who has a professional standing, like a professional adjudicator? Is there a penalty for deviating from what the app tells you to do? In other words, is the app monitoring the professionalization of these adjudicators? Is there another way to explain the answer? So is there some other way that you can understand what the app is telling you? And can the algorithm be considered persuasive speech, which I thought was a really interesting um, uh, aspect of this. Is the algorithm persuading the adjudicator in some way, um, swaying them in one direction or the other? And um, does the adjudicator's job, are they pressured to go faster? So it's like, okay, you got this algorithm, algorithm that means that you have to do 20 more things this day, this week, whatever it is. So they come up with establishing a binding test. Um, and that binding test would start to uh, 
create a way to understand when the algorithm is binding and when it's not. And this would allow, um, this would avoid notice and comment, but also allow for some kind of testing and court. So that's my basic overview of what was going on in that paper. Um, very interesting detail to you look at to read more. Um, the second paper is uh, the Sausage Factory, three case studies from state legislatures. Now, these are beautiful legislative histories. I have to say I worked on the Hill and I love a good legislative history. And these are state legislation, uh, state legislatures and what's been going on for the last five years for three different robotic techniques. So you have autonomous vehicles, you have automated sidewalk delivery bots for people who were there yesterday at the workshop. We had a little taste of that. And then we have um, automated mobile carrying devices, which is more like cargo, which I didn't know existed, but totally fascinating. All right. So the basic gist of this that I really got from reading this legislative history is that the companies are really writing the regulations with some good reason, right? But with some very problematic outcomes. So a couple of things that happened with around this, I'm just gonna name some of the things that came up in these different cases and then talk about the big picture. Um, one is that there are pilot projects. So a lot of municipal municipalities will say, well, we're just gonna try this once and then see what happens. And when they do this pilot project, it's into a limited area. So it's just like, we're just gonna do it in this downtown or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Then they start to add different requirements to operate. So like in Florida, you started doing the insurance in DC, they had delivery limits. Um, I think for the autonomous vehicle one, there were, does anybody know how much their car weighs? I, this is just, this is a question. I, I started talking to these people who knew how much their car weighed. And I was just like, that's, I don't know if that's natural. So. It's probably around three tons, so. He knows how much his car weighs, but you wrote the article. Yeah, no yeah. fair, not fair. Pay attention to cars, so. You know how much your car weighs? Is it over 10,000 pounds? Okay, wait, there's a no over here. That means you know how much your car weighs. <laughs> Less than, do you actually know the exact number? Oh, all right, so 10,000 pounds is a lot. All right, I just. Yeah, you're getting into uh, commercial delivery trucks once you get that high. Okay, and that's. That was the goal, and that was the goal. Like, and that is actually. Why they wrote it at 10,000 pounds is because then you move into commercial delivery space and that's a different set of people that are impacted. Got it, all right, so now I understand what that number meant. And is it also like 10,000 pounds loaded? Uh, no, this is the gross vehicle weight. It's usually with what the manufacturer has to state, this is what our car weighs. And oh. it's those that are above that, that are excluded by the legislation in California from being able to operate as an automated vehicle under their regulatory regime. Got it. Okay, that was just, that was like my aside, that was not planned, but you're all the people who know how to open up your car and know what the tire pressure number is. Like, I don't fall in that category. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, you're laughing because you know, you know, I don't know. All right, and then the main part here is that there are different local ordinances. And when we're talking about this one-on-one -on -one legislation, they're all in local municipalities, like here and not there, which all impacts how this works. Now, then we have to think about how the laws are actually gonna be applied and who they're gonna be applied to. We just heard this, but I don't understand why the 10,000 pounds is. Um, there was Nevada SB, was it 480? talking about the difference between personal delivery devices and then um, I think more professional delivery uh, devices. It's who is the device operator versus who is the device owner and how that would impact liability. And then the other part of the legislative history starts to talk about the bill trajectory. So when I was working on the Hill, I helped release the open legislation, open legislative data. So we thought a lot about where a bill starts and then where bill, where bill goes and then how people document it. So here for these cases, what happened with when the definitions into the legislative process? Think like the ages, the models, the weights, these definitions that we're talking about where you're very specific about who the law applies to. And then you start getting into questions of immunity, which is all you lawyers talk about. Um, and then part of the legislative uh, process that I thought was very important was talking about local and national politics. So the law, um, there was some partnership with Walmart um, in Arkansas, which influenced whether the pilot would happen or not. Or another case, I think it was Kansas, it was about the Koch brothers. So you start to see all the different things that come into play about whether legislation can even happen and know that, that it's, it is a sausage factory. There are all these things behind it that make it. So what's the big picture here? 
is that despite all these differences, there are these different forms of industry consensus where the definitions, the liability, who's responsible, they're starting to converge in some interesting way. There are lobbyist groups, um, industry lobbyist groups that have something to do with it, but it's also, uh, in, at least me as an information professional, I'm fascinated about how bills are copied between states and that also plays a factor in how they propagate through. So this leaves us with a couple of questions from this, um, this example. Um, who writes the bills? Uh, for almost all of the legislation that is discussed here, it was really about, uh, they were initially written by industry with some good reason. They knew exactly how it worked. They would know how uh, the, the specific details. Um, but the other part is who supports the bill and pushes a bill through the legislative process. That requires lobbyists. That requires people who have some political know-how of how things work and who's gonna be on which side. Um, and then the other side of that is equally important, who opposes the bill and who uh, is able to get that, who, who thinks that the bill is getting in their way and is gonna take active steps to oppose it. And then we come into this really deep question that I love to think about when I was on the Hill is who should legislatures trust? Who has the right information and how are they gonna know it's the right information? Um, when I was, uh, I still do some consulting when some things are coming up for, for legislative process. They're desperate to figure out, is it this lobbyist or this lobbyist? And very often it's something in between, but how are they gonna know when they're really, really specific details about you know, how much does a hen weigh? Um, or other things that not everybody would know, like how much a car would weigh. Okay, somebody knows what that joke was. These are timed jokes. You'll laugh later when you're leaving the audience. Um, but how can non-experts enter into this lobbying space? How can non-experts enter into this conversation when there's so many technical details that we're not all familiar with? So I'm gonna um, let you sit and resonate and marinate and all of that goodness that we learned from these legislative histories. Cause I, I do think that whatever we do propose if we can't understand what actually happens on the ground legislatively we're all kind of sunk. And this moves on into thinking about our um, our third uh, piece. So um, at this one, we're, we've been going into the future, right? Uh, thinking about flying cars. Oh no, not flying cars. Just automated de delivery vehicles. But um, Bargavi is asking us to go back, all the way back to 1800. And we're gonna think about um, the Steamboat Act of 1852. Just love it, these little acts that still exist on the books. Uh, and here we're thinking about the example of steamboat regulation in the 1800s and its challenge to the skepticism that we currently have that, oh no, we can never regulate AI. That's what people said about steamboats. So uh, let's, let's jump into uh, the history. So the 1769 invention that was popularized by 1811 and then finally regulated in 1850. Let me just repeat that. It was invented in 1769. It was popularized and then used by 1811. And then we had the, the act in 1852. So things take time. And I think that was one of the lessons of, of this article. Things actually really do take time. So when it was invented, um, the uh, it was like, oh, this is cool. This is gonna re revolutionize our world. And then things started to explode. So you have these high pressure, it's steamboat, high pressure things, exploration. 21% of river accidents were based on these explosions, 21%. So if you just wanted to take a little trip down whichever river, um, there was this very high likelihood that you would not be coming back, you know. Then your worst relative, I don't know, but it's not a good idea as a stable way to go. So um, uh, our authors introduced some ways to think about this. Um, is it MAUST, that the MAUST 2012, came up with these categories of governance options that talk about how we can think through uh, governance. And I thought they were, I, I hadn't seen this uh, citation before, definitely gonna pick it up. So one is information, I'll just say them all, information, mechanical, penalty, and regulatory. And so information is how do you collect information? That's a lot of what I do, I look at, um, the uh, regulatory information infrastructure around finance, um, but you're collecting data to understand what's going on. Mechanical, which is that you, the government is subsidizing innovation. 
So the government is doing its own tests to learn more about how it would work and not relying on anybody else, but having that capability internally or um, issuing a grant to somebody who does have that capability. Penalty is what we're all familiar with when we think about regulation, which is that there's a liability, you mess up, you get in trouble and you pay. You always have to pay at the end of it, or maybe there's some uh, court case. And then um, regulatory is just actual legislation and then supervision. So um, what year did this, was it the 1852? Institute, what was it called? I didn't write that down. Yeah, so there were there were two sets of regulation actually. So in 1838, you have your first regulation and so the penalty option of liability. Uh, they had this criminal negligence standard. Uh, well, they actually called it manslaughter provision, um, which was part of the penalty option, but that was removed in the 1852 version, which was now moving towards having a regulator. And that's the supervisor, the, su the yeah, new supervisor the agency. The inspector of steamboats. Okay, um, did not write that down. <laughs> but you, just in 1852, you could aspire to be a supervisor of blah, 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 blah steamboats, right? <laughs> Whatever it is, you might want to turn your mic off. Um, and so now we started to create the regulatory state. And I think it was the first national uh, supervision. Yep. Right, yeah, and that's that's when they create the first kind of regulatory body for the purposes of regulating commercial um, uh, industries in general, yeah. Yeah, so now we're starting to actually build out the regulatory state that is able to respond to these issues. So in um, the, towards the end of the paper, they start thinking about how this could apply to AI. Um, and one of my favorite parts about the steamboats is that when there's an explosion, it destroys all the evidence and nobody could know. It's very much like um, we're saying all of the big companies, like we can't see the evidence. How are we ever going to regulate it? Well, it was just literally blown up on the Mississippi. So nobody could know what happened, whether it's the operator or the regulator. So we're in a really similar situation in a lot of ways. Um, only our problem is that there's too much information to grasp in some ways. Um, it's at such scale that nobody can understand it, which is almost like having it blow up. And uh, and then you have to have somebody who actually knows how it works. And that information is also, also often limited within a corporation. And we also have a lot of conflicts of interest in tech of the people who know might not be the people to advise and all of that. So the Algorithmic Accountability Act um, introduced this idea of impact assessments, which is one possible process to go. But I like the way they thought about these, these four tasks from mouse are ways that we could go forward. They're not roadblocks, but they're roadblocks, but they're actual tasks that we have to complete to get to the next stage. And I think we have to kind of cover all of them. It's not just one. Um, and they they do mention that it was 30 years for steamboat regulation, because I forgot about the 19, the 1838 Act. Um, and I'll just remind us all, right, the 1996 Telecommunications Act was the reauthorization of the 1976 Telecommunication Act, which uh, ran out in 86. Uh, and it took 10 years for it to come together. So these things do take time, even if there's an intention, even if there's a reauthorization, we still have to move things forward in different ways. So as we come together with these papers, um, I want us to think a little bit about uh, how we can struggle to make AI regulation and governance actually happen. We have a great opportunity to think not just about some future perfect law out there, but how to use existing law, existing legislation, existing processes to get us there. And I think that's the unique thread stringing these papers together. So overall, we have these three approaches. We have, um, we could establish a binding test. We could consider the realities of making law, both politics, financial, all the rest of it, and what it means in the corporation, right, the first draft. And then also look to history to see um, sort of the long game of not only looking back, but how long it's going to take us to actually get to the point where we're going to have effective regulation. So for the authors, I, um, I just told them I might have some explicit comments for them to improve the flow of their papers. But today, I'd like to talk about the possibilities that these papers offer and thinking through new forms of regulation um, and specifically how these proposals might work in concert. Um, how is it that we can gather the lobbyists? How can we gather the people who are other types of advisors to legislatures, and then also the legal professionals working through the courts to figure out how this could work, and then also the notice and comment process as it exists in some ways to uh, move these forward. 
Uh, those are my basic comments for the paper. And I'd like to open up to questions to see if people have specific things that they would like to ask about that. And while you're, I don't know, this could either be a group of lawyers where everyone's gonna be at the mic, but I'm gonna let you think about it. And I'm gonna ask the panelists to jump in if they have any comments or if you have any comments for each other about how these things could work in concert. Anybody? And anybody in the audience who has a question, you know, feel free to come up to the mic. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anne. That was a that was a great sort of introduction to everything. And uh, I I read through both the y'all's papers. I thought they were fantastic. Uh, um, as I mentioned, I, I thought that the uh, the rules versus guidance paper was delightfully cynical. And that you're just sort of like overtly saying, well, I know you hate rules, uh, notice and comment rulemaking. And so in order to avoid it, you should just be better. And this is how you can be better. And <laughs> if you're good, then you can avoid this sort of thing. And if not, then we'll sue you. And then we'll, uh, then you'll, then you'll mute, mute it by being better that way. So, um, but there was, there was one thing that, that sort of stuck out to me that I, I, I didn't know if maybe you wanted to comment on or, or to think about, but um. I thought that the the one thing that could improve this is if we thought about how guidance for such algorithms is being used, like how do we gather the data on for post hoc uh, challenges to these? Because you mentioned one of the challenges is that you have agencies that slowly change the way that guidance works so that it eventually becomes binding on these adjudicators. And like, how do we recognize that in real time? And I think about it in my context where I work with members who work with adjudicators and that, you know, there will be people who notice this. And the question is, how do we gather the data in order to make those cases? Because there'll be people who know that this is happening, but how do we make that out there? And how do we maybe, uh, you know, attacking the APA is, is impossible, but you made it small changes so you're gathering more information. I don't know if that's something you thought of too, or if you want to comment on. Yeah, um, it's certainly hard to, to get agencies to give you data uh, to sort of do these audits. Uh, there was one, I would say, successful case and uh, with the NYCLU uh, on ICE's RTA algorithm where they did gather data and sort of made this argument that uh, the RTA algorithm was practically binding. But um, that's why we rely on a lot of like structural arguments and say, um, information that you can probably get, which is how is the algorithm presented to the adjudicator? Uh, what are the, the structures surrounding that? And um, how much work does the adjudicator have to do on top of uh, the recommendation of the algorithm? And so that these structural elements are probably things that you can find out uh, and give you hints about, you know, is this actually binding or is this not? And I think that's probably the successful approach to, to use something like this now. But obviously, and, and we sort of briefly touched on this, is it would be great if there's like, uh, you know, legislative updates that uh, instill more transparency and more data sharing such that you can actually have a much better sense of, of what's going on. And, uh, but I, you know, going along with a cynical view, I'm not sure how, how speedy the tra transparency requirement would uh, happen. So I think, Right now, we have to work with structural elements, and where you can get data, you you know go through FOIA and things like that to get that data, which is how the NYCLU brought their lawsuit. So that's uh, great. And then, oh, sorry, did you want to say something now? No, no. Okay, I'm going to go to the question in the audience, and then we'll come back to what we have to say. So can you can you hold there? All right, audience member, question. Hi. So I, I have uh, two questions: one about guidance, and one about steamboats. Um, with the steamboat question. Um, I don't know if I should feel happy or sad with the analogy um, in the sense that on the one hand, yay, we've been able to tackle challenging problems in the past. On the other hand, it took a century, um, which feels bad. So I'm curious as to whether this this is an example that ends up filling with you with hope or a little bit of despair. Um, the question about guidance is, uh, it's possible that I missed something, but in terms of you, you, it felt like you very much wanted to, if you can't demonstrate structure and you're trying to directly demonstrate uh, uh, bindingness, then you wanted causal proof. And so here's here's my my hypo. Like we've got an, because algorithms aren't always about changing 
the outcomes. They can just be about getting the same results more cheaply and more quickly and efficiently. So imagine that there's an agency that has a particular pattern of behavior. It institutes an algorithm which remarkably enough trained on the last five years of the agency's behavior mimics it very well, such that going forward, everybody uses the algorithm, behavior doesn't change at all. And yet remarkably, every decision is exactly congruent with what the algorithm recommends. Is that not a binding algorithm under your view and just a guidance? And if so, is that a good result? Um, I'm so glad you asked this question because I was just about to uh, offer that comment based on uh, and characterization of it. Um, so the 30 years timeline, um, it took us a long time, was not really the orientation I was hoping to go for there. I was, sliding, I was slightly hoping to be more optimistic in that, yes, it took 30 years back then, but they didn't even have regulatory agencies back then. And so, you know, we're talking about a really different framework. Um, and hopefully we have much more to go off of at this point, because we already have gotten through many of the other stages of governance that I talk about. Um, and that, you know, there's some hope and optimism there. But of course, I'm not going to say that like extremely optimistically, because I'm aware of the political environment and how that influences legislation, etc. And so, um, well, but let's remain optimistic, at least from my standpoint. Um, and I, this wasn't related to your question, but just very quickly, I thought it was really interesting um, reading your paper, Daniel, about um, how you talked about the uh, industry not really wanting to bring testing into the legislation. And that was so interesting, and I think in um, conversation with the paper we wrote, because so much of what was done and which we talk about as being successful was this testing that was done in the steamboats and the way that um, the conditions were reconstructed by the Franklin Institute um, as a think tank on, on the outside, which was doing a lot of this testing. So anyway, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that later, but I don't want to move the conversation away from your question. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the question around guidance, it's definitely a hard causal inference problem if you're trying to do a post hoc explanation. Uh, and this is actually something that the court in the uh, ICE RCA case had to struggle with, right? Because they were brought, ex, you know, ex post data to say, okay, there's this is actually binding, and so that's why we focus again on structural elements, right? So if they train this model and they say you should now follow and, and put in place all these structures that say you should follow exactly what this model says, if conditions change. Uh, and there's all these structural elements that prevent adjudicators from you know, exercising their discretion based on changing elements, that is much more rule-like. And we actually want uh, sort of notice and comment process to happen there. But uh, again, that requires some of these structural elements. Other papers have suggested um, sort of Benchmarking, for example, you do tests every once in a while to see uh, are adjudicators exercising, exercising discretion. And so one thing you could do, for example, is, you know, like an RCT, right? Adjudicator with the algorithm, adjudicator without the algorithm, uh, what happens? Do they, does the behavior change, right, for those sets of adjudicators? But then you start to get into like RCT land and causal inference, uh, and it's very hard uh, to figure that out. But uh, so again, that's why we uh, focus on structural elements. But again, I, ideally, you would actually want the agencies to do these sorts of RCTs to make sure that the algorithm is working as expected, to make sure that adjudicators are you know, exercises, exercising discretion where it's needed. So uh, I think there's a, a couple of different ways to tackle the problem. One is structural and one is instituting the, the mechanisms required to draw those causal inferences. And just to make a note, RCT, randomized controlled trials. Um, was that a question? Sure. And then I'll get over to you. Um, so I, I was, I had some difficulty, uh, Peter, understanding um, your definition of discretion. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, uh, one way of reading the definition, uh, I think it turns out every decision is 
discretionary. And I just really was having having trouble grasping what you were trying to get at. So I have a hypo for you. Um, and maybe you can tell me whether or not this is guidance um, or, uh, or not. Um, so the hypo is this, there's an immigration hearing officer, they're making erratic decisions. We suspect this is because of impermissible biases of various sorts. And so uh, we give them a training program and a checklist that makes them think about the possible biases. And then after we do all this, after they've seen, to simplify it, after they've seen the training video and they start using the checklist, then their decisions become non-erratic. They're sort of like, we look at, it turns out now they are correctly applying the law in each and every case. So is that rulemaking or is that guidance? I would think that as those terms are ordinarily understood in the law, that's a paradigm case of guidance. But as I understood your definition, it would be rulemaking. Um, so I think in that case, it's a lot like, for example, the SSA has a, an algorithm where they uh, read over an adjudicator's opinion and suggest changes. For example, if you didn't address a claim that was brought up uh, and, you know, that's much more guidance like because unlike the ICE RCA example, where if the officer deviates, they have to get manager approval. Uh, here, you're providing a checklist, providing training, you know, it's much more guidance-like. But uh, I will say that, you know, part of our exploration with this paper, uh, as many who are familiar with the APA will know, is this is a murky area and uh, it can get complicated, but it's something that the courts already are having to start to wade through. And uh, I think we're trying to figure out uh, what elements from the CS literature, from Bayesian persuasion, from HCI, uh, human computer interaction, uh, what elements of that research and those empirical studies can we bring in to provide uh, better information on uh, what, the, what sort of structural elements tend to make things more binding? So in the case you described, uh, the court would, you know, hopefully examine not just what is this checklist and what is this training, uh, but what are the structural elements around that? Uh, do uh, how much effort is required to fill out this checklist? Do they does the checklist, for example, require them to go look for other evidence, for example, using a particular source of evidence, and then make a decision? Or is the checklist si simply saying, um, "We recommend that you do this action. Did you do this action? If yes." Uh, great. If no, go talk to your manager, right? So a checklist like that is much more rule-like because uh, you're basically imposing penalties uh, if they deviate from the recommended action, right? So uh, not sure if that answers your question, but uh, in terms of your first point about uh, the definition of discretion, uh, this is certainly something that we're uh, actively working on and revising. Uh, like I said, this is a very murky area and uh, definitely take some time to iterate and, and uh, wade through the, the law in this area. So thanks so much for the feedback. So excited we had a hypothetical. I feel like a lawyer. Um, over here. Hi, uh, Tarek, he, him pronouns, um, student here and uh, intern at the Future Privacy Forum. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't quite expect uh, the analogy uh, of steamboats to be so like succinct. And so I was really just generally fascinated about that. And um, I think, um, discussion that that we're having here like reminds me of um there was a uh the new york times podcast uh talking about the failure of the 737 max and talking about the way that the regulatory landscape has adjusted like in this case with the faa and um we kind of touched on it a little bit here about talking about that information asymmetry that kind of exists um and um i guess i had two questions that came kind of um, come from that, I guess, one, um, the kind of the use of, I guess, mechanic, uh, I guess, mechanical rulemaking, I believe the term was of like, using um, subsidizing and research to 
uh, better understand technology before it gets out. And I'm curious um, if any of the panelists have any thoughts on that. The other one is the, um, I guess, the increasing role, at least within the technology world of like standardization bodies and what those, and it's a little, it's kind of a, it's a circle peg in a square, a square hole of some sort, but um, it seems like naively there might be some potential there for, I guess, bridging that information asymmetry. And so I was curious to hear any thoughts any, any of y'all have on that. Great, so we're talking about information asymmetry. Um, there's a question about uh, possibility of subsidizing research, and then another question about the role of standardization bodies. Um, Bargavi, did you wanna jump in? Sure, yeah, um, and some of this is still, I think, remains to be solved. Um, that's why we're talking about it, of course. In the paper, we talk about um, the mechanical option and the challenges it faces in our current environment. And one of the challenges we identify is that um, there is such a strong industry presence, um, which you know we're seeing throughout the papers is that, and that um, this industry presence is not only like in legislative capacity, but also within academia as well. You have a lot of people who are talking about, um, Meredith Whitaker and others are talking about the industry capture of academia. And so that was one of the things that we, um, brought up as one of the challenges to actually um, having a robust mechanical option um, through research funding. Um, and one of the policy solutions that we offered is that the company should be required, uh, you know, certain tax policies, that the money then goes to, um, uh, to the government, and then the government then allocates that money towards research. Um, of course, like, you know, that's not going to be the most popular um, policy uh, option, but it was one that we thought of that, you know, um, could could mitigate this issue. Um, and in general, managing conflicts of interest, as you mentioned, the FAA um, example, it's, it's something that I think we've continued to struggle with. Um, and I don't have like a succinct answer for that. And I think that's going to be uh, that that issue, to me at least, feels like it's being exacerbated in our current environment with information asymmetry. It seems to be even more uh, information asymmetry as we go along. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't have that much experience on the standardization bodies question. So if someone else wants to take that, um... yeah, I can I can jump in on the the standardization bodies question because that. I mean, it was raised in, uh, I believe Margaret raised it earlier, uh, talking about the fact that these bodies are, are very opaque. Um, getting onto them requires a special invitation and how they're made up ultimately impacts the, what, what ultimately, you know, what, what they're gonna standardize, how they're gonna frame it. And, and one of the things that I talked about a lot in my paper is that who has the pen? I mean, I, I, Kent Siverud was my uh, dean at Wash U when I was there. And he talked about all the time, own the pen have the pen. If you get to write the first draft, you get to set the terms of the debate. You get to set the terms of the negotiation. Everything that we're talking about comes from who has the pen. And these standardization bodies often are framing some of the definitional, definitional questions about how do we think about automated vehicles, for example. Like we've, we've mentioned level four, level five, these SAE standardized ways. I'm not sure that's the best way to talk about it. It certainly isn't a very... Uh, uh, easy to understand an intuitive framework for understanding automated vehicles and the different ways of classifying them. And it certainly has very little impact on how you regulate them. I think that there are much better ways to frame that question. But we've kind of been locked into this, this framework that forms the backbone of now it's in law in a, in a dozen states or more. And it's the way we're thinking about this technology and it's and it's and it's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it's it's you know the the same companies that were part of the standardization process are the companies that are writing the first drafts of the legislation that are using this definition. And there are debates all through that process. Like I know that there were people in the SAE debates who were thinking about it from a consumer perspective and trying to push back on it, but they're consensus organizations. And so you find ways that you can build in definitions that can benefit you subtly that are then exacerbated as you go forward and things like that. So that's one of the things about the, the standardization bodies that I wanna say. But on the information asymmetry uh, and the subsidizing research aspect, uh, just sometimes build, like, so if you were able to build sort of like an independent set of 
uh, researchers who understood sidewalk delivery bots, who understood automated vehicles, who aren't from industry could come in and testify on it. That's good. That can be helpful. But you need, uh, they would need to be heard by the legislators, right? And that requires sort of like an ideological orientation of the legislators that is aligned with those independent researchers. And so if the legislators are interested more in sort of jobs and positioning our state as being tech forward and that we're going to attract talent and we're going to subsidize this industry by sort of creating a permissive regulatory framework, like all of the pushback in the world isn't necessarily going to overcome that um, because the industry is going to come in and say, we are being, we're putting safety first, right? It's the way that every single thing's going to be led. If we're putting safety first. They're going to try to use those same arguments forward. So it's not necessarily clear to me that even overcoming the information asymmetry is going to change the underlying dynamics and the logic in, in, in all states. So I think one of the single most um, important things that could change is if government employees could be on more standards bodies. I was a part of the W3C when I was in the ledge branch, and it really made a difference to have somebody on the ground who didn't have a commercial interest. And the W3C does encourage that. Okay, we have a number of questions here. Go right ahead. Hi, Kate Darling, MIT. Um, Bargavi, I really, really love the Steamboat paper so much. Um, this isn't even going to be like a helpful question for the paper itself. It's more of kind of a yes and for like what's next. Um, I just like because there's this, I, I feel like there's this pervasive idea in um, AI policy that we're dealing with these completely new questions that have never been solved before. And obviously that's sometimes true. Otherwise we wouldn't have this conference, but there's so much we can learn from history. And then the the problem with looking at one specific example, which is not a problem with your paper, but obviously there are some differences and you, you talk about the differences. Um, but what if we had a collection of different examples. So I know that Kristen Tomasen has worked on, has, she's written about what we can learn for drone policy from looking at uh, how we've regulated vehicles in the past. Um, I'd love to write a chapter on the law of bees, which is this incredible like edge case of like responsibility for harm and like categorization. So like, what if we did like an edited volume? <laughs> so if you and or any of your co-authors would be interested in working on something like that, please hit me up. Thank you so much. Um, and that's very kind. Uh, yeah, we actually, it's funny you say that because um, my, my co-authors, uh, Shannon Veller and I, were actually working on a book chapter right now um, where we're talking about our framing of responsibility gaps and then looking at specific examples. So um, at this point, yeah, we do have the idea of having a couple more different examples to compare. Um, so thanks a lot for that. But I'm also open to working on, on this more because this is a pet project of mine. Um, I had the same observation coming newer into this field was that a lot of what was discussed um, made it seem like these problems were entirely new and could not be solved. Um, and that's really what we're trying to push against in the future. Thank you. Buzz, 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 buzz. Our next person. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Cindy Grimm, OSU. Yeah, no, I love this steamboat thing because I, as an engineer, I am always saying there's nothing in here. You've done this all before. Um, one thing that really struck me, a couple things, I'm gonna put together a couple things that I've heard so far today. So one is legislation has changed, right? So the ability to do legislation in from that steamboat, like from then to now, like we have much more of a sense of we should have regulation bodies, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like there's the same, there's a similar transformation in engineering. Like back when they were first doing the first Coke bottles with the battle beads, things would explode, saws that cut people's fingers off, right? There, there's a notion now that you can engineer safety. I mean, with simulation and computer science simulation, you can you can do a lot more of this, like, let's see what would happen before you actually kill somebody. Um, so <laughs> we hope. Um, but so sort of what I want to ask there is um, one thing that was said earlier in the last session was like, let's pay engineers the same salary to work for a government body as they would for, you know, a commercial company. So that helps address the inequity of all the experts are in industry. But I also think there's a separate thing there in the science literature that needs to change too, which is that there's an emphasis in the science literature about novelty. Right. So you must you know if it's not new. And then you see in psychology recently that they've started doing these replication studies, like actually funding replication studies. Right. And I feel like maybe we're at the point here with AI 
and safety training and whatnot, that we really need to say that, you know, the people who do the studies on let's evaluate how this is going to work when we actually put it in the public, let's evaluate the safety, like funding a group that does that, that is independent from industry and independent, you know, and then, and I'm sort of thinking here, the Army Corps engineers, right? We have this Army Corps of engineers because there's this body of people that you can pull from. <laughs> so what does every state do? It's like, I need a bridge. Please give me the Army Corps of engineers so I can have a bridge, right? So if you sort of build up this resource that maybe you can address some of that industry imbalance by putting together a research group that any sort of state or industry could pull from and say, I really want to get some expertise and scientific understanding of risk management, which didn't exist back in the steamboat age. Anyway, it's just sort of a random, a random thought, but I love the steamboat analogy, it's awesome. Um, I definitely 100% agree with that. Um, and yeah, this, this emphasis on novelty is something that's been brought up by other researchers recently as well. So um, if, you're, if you've seen any of Arvind Narayanan's work, um, they've been doing a lot on replication studies, which I think is really, really important work. And um, I think that looking in the past in the steamboat analogy too, you can see where that was really useful, having a group of scientists that was really just trying to replicate these disasters to understand um, and that is fundamental science and that's fundamental engineering. And I think, at least from my reading of a lot of this historical stuff recently, it feels like we've moved far away from a lot of that. Um, and that's something that, you know, it would be get better to get back into it. Um, and uh, in general, like that is, I think the perspective of a lot of uh, the older safety engineers as well is that they want to move us in that direction. And you mentioned about salaries. I think salaries are only the tip of the iceberg. I actually think data infrastructure and data access is a really big information asymmetry because even if you paid the same salaries, um, I am not going to have the access to Google's data or their large language model production capabilities. And so that asymmetry would not be um, you know, addressed through that. And so that's something too that we need to really think about, I think. Yeah, and just to, to follow up, briefly on that, the, um, you see this in the sort of the automated vehicle space where uh, you know, consumer reports can get access to Tesla's vehicles. And so they test them. IHHS does crash testing on vehicles, but that has to be publicly available before they can do that sort of stuff. Um, and you can't get access to Waymo's vehicle. You can't get access to Cruise or any of the, the automated driving companies. And they're, and they're probably always going to be that way, right? That's how they're structuring their operations is to keep them entirely in house. And it's unclear how we're gonna be able to get there until NHTSA or NTSB is diving in there and that'll have to be after a crash or after a series of crashes. Uh, yeah, and just to follow up, there's a, I think a lot of great work right now happening in the AI research community, maybe not industry on like uh, reproducibility and safety. Uh, I know there was some discussion earlier on uh, definitional issues for AI safety, but there is a group of folks uh, who think of AI safety as robustness and reproducibility and um, testing out what these failure modes are and how to make sure they don't happen. Um, and so like every year there's a reproducibility challenge where uh, professors ask their students to replicate a major paper. And, you know, a lot of, sometimes they find that some major papers don't replicate and uh, then publish that. And so I think uh, there is starting to be more emphasis on this, which is great. Uh, and if we can keep that rolling into, uh, like you were saying, into uh, more industry type contexts, which are actually being deployed, that'd be great. Yeah, I also just want to give a shout out to the critical benchmark studies world. Um, they're looking at robustness and information infrastructure for machine learning. Underlies all of that. It's another layer. Next speaker. Next. Hi, everyone. I really enjoyed all three of the papers. Thank you so much. I, I had a, a question for Daniel, though. Um, reading the paper sort of left me a little bit dispirited. I sort of read it and just felt like, wow, we're really just uh, losing a lot of really good opportunities here. And, and I was left actually wondering sort of what can we do about it? And I really appreciate Han's comment. Uh, one concrete thing that we could do is work to have uh, government employees on, on more standards bodies. Uh, and, and so one of the things that I sort of found myself slipping into is I wonder if you'll sort of join me in the bad ideas lounge uh, again for a second. Um, and just to sort of think about um, what are ways that we can uh, 
think maybe um, conceptually about how to improve this sort of state of affairs, because I do a lot of my research in the privacy world where we see some good ideas sort of get floated in certain spaces, but then at the state level, we just get some hot garbage um, of state laws that end up getting passed um, as a result of, I think, a lot of sort of industry input on things. And so um, one of the things that that you wrote a few times in the paper is, um, you know, the companies uh, will and potentially must play a role in crafting legislation. Um, there's nothing inherently sort of wrong with that. Let's, in the bad ideas lounge, what if we were to challenge that? What if we were to, and maybe I've been reading sort of Ari Waldman's, uh, uh, too much of Ari's work, but um, the idea is what if we were to say, um, just as a matter of norms, first draft of laws, generally speaking, as a normative matter, not you know prohibiting uh, any sort of interaction, but just shouldn't be written uh, uh, from any, any sort of industry standpoint. Um, and what would that look like, right? So, in, and as, as for those that weren't here yesterday, we did the bad ideas lounge, um, and we sort of threw out our worst ideas for regulating robots. And and I throw this out there not to say that this is sort of exactly where we should go, but what would we lose out on if we did that, right? If we created a norm where industry did not have the pin, as you say, mm -hmm. um, for the first draft of laws, would it be a sort of knowledge paucity that we would lose out on? And if so, are there any sort of scaffolding structures we can create to help remedy that, that would say um, require moving of information to uh other areas, right, to academics, to researchers? Um, is it a sort of governance question? And, you know, if we create a norm, does that sort of, you know, mess with public governance about the ability of all stakeholders affected by legislation to play some role, even if we have a, a norm against it? So anyway, I just I just wanted to sort of throw it out there as um, maybe just a thought experiment more than anything else in the Bad Ideas Lounge. So, no, thank, thank you, you for the question. That's a that's a fantastic question because I think it really raises a lot of uh, the issues about why, why do we have laws about any of these things anyway, right? Um, one of the reasons why I really wanted to include the mobile carrier section about these uh, Piaggio fast forward Gita little backpack robots, there is nothing in what I've read about it or understood on this that suggests that they needed to have a new law passed in order to regulate a backpack that follows behind me versus a backpack that's on my back, right? There's nothing inherent about the technology that would make anybody go like, oh, we need, we need laws to regulate this. What happened is Starship Robotics started passing these laws about the sidewalk delivery bots because there was an open question about whether they could be operating an autonomous robot on sidewalks and going forward. And instead of doing what we'd seen from other industries of just dumping it there and figuring it out later when someone gets mad, they went forward. They did what I would consider to be the right thing and went to the states, went to uh, Washington, D.C. and said, hey, we've got these things. We want to do it. We want to be there. We want to work with you and collaborate and, and passing a law that allows this to work for us. That law was written largely in collaboration with them. I mean, they built the technology. They had the idea. I don't think it's inherently wrong for them to say, this is what we think it should look like, and we're open to feedback, right? Like that. So like, I, I think that we might lose out on some things like that. But in the passing of the Starship bills, they were written in a way that captured these rolling backpacks. And so all of a sudden, Piaggio is looking at this going, did we just get outlawed in Virginia? Right? Or do, do our do the do the people who buy my rolling backpack, which are expensive and nice consumer products, now need to carry a hundred thousand dollar commercial auto pol policy in order to operate this on the road? So, um, you know, I think that there's nothing inherently wrong with industry being the ones who because they're developing the product, and I, there there are roboticists in here. I have tremendous respect for anybody who is working on the technology side of this. It is very hard to build robots. I have recognized that and sort of paying attention to this from afar. And I have tremendous respect for the people who want to build things that they think are going to genuinely make the world a better place, right? That's why they're doing it. And if they're going to build things that make the world a better place, I don't think there's a problem with them coming to the table to write it. Deep breath. That's the that. issue <laughs> is when but... it's taken to its extreme, right? And so, because at the end of the day, I think the lessons for uh, the, the mobile carrying backpacks carry through to all robotics. They would rather not have rules in place at all. 
right? Um, one of the big changes we saw from, uh, so in my paper, I go through the different state bills on automated vehicles. And the first bill was passed in Nevada. Um, uh, Google was major, the major player at the time. They went to Nevada, worked with regulators there, passed a version of the bill to let them test and do everything there. But they explicitly regulated the testing phase of automated vehicles, right? When that came around to Michigan, and after the Obama administration put out guidance on this is how we think states should be regulating these technologies, Michigan made the explicit decision that we do not need to be testing. We're regulating the testing phase of automated vehicles because when you have a person behind a wheel, that is driving. We don't need to change the law to do that. And so if you have a technical supervisor, which is I think is how the, at least the English translation for what the German law is. So German, they, they passed the law, that allows the testing of automated vehicles, but you have to have a technical supervisor in them. That is not necessary in the vast majority of the United States right now, because the only thing they want to regulate is what happens when you remove that human from the vehicle, because that leads to uh, what Brian Walker Smith pointed out, is that's where things get weird. That's where we don't know the regulatory framework for automated vehicles on the road. So that's where we need a new law. And so if the only laws that we're passing are for the bare minimum necessary in order to get these on the road, that's what we end up with at the, at the other extreme of just allowing industry to write it without any pushback. Um, and then the last thing you asked about was sort of like, what more can we do or how do we get this better? I think that paying attention is probably the first thing we can start to do because you talked about how states are passing these bills. Like there's, I'd like, I'm there sometimes. There are some people that are there that are involved. Um, Phil Koopman has started paying attention to these. He's a roboticist out of Carnegie Mellon. But there's not that much attention paid to a lot of these bills as they're going through the state legislative process. And so just attention and thoughtful public comment about them um, is one way that you can sort of start having the conversation to at least raise the temperature, raise the attention level on these bills that we're, we're regulating robots and we're putting the first draft in place and no one's really paying attention until somebody gets hurt. And that's when I think a lot of attention will be paid to some of these bills. Sorry, I'm, I know that was long. No, that's great. Some great ideas. Um, any feedback? I, I also want to say that there are bazillion ways to track laws automatically. If anybody wants to talk to me about it, I could tell you about it. So there should be some people who are together watching all the state legislatures because um, it's easy to do now. Anyhow, we have a question here and then we have a question here. Thank you. Um... I'm Justin Bullock. I'm over at Evans and the Policy School. I really uh, enjoyed seeing the theme on AI governance from all three papers. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, papers are very interesting. I have questions for Peter um, or Garvey. And uh, Peter, first, um, kind of hearkening back to the discretion question, um, uh, there's a really interesting debate in the public administration and public management uh, literature on what is discretion, do, does the advent of AI um, uh, curtail it or enable it. And uh, as I was going through your paper, it, I think it might benefit uh, from pulling from some of that literature. It's really kind of an interesting debate and um, could situate your uh, attempt at uh, redefining discretion, which I also have papers where I try to define discretion. It's no easy task. And so kudos to you for that. Um, I also um, really like this example of the Social Security Administration, uh, the paper from Kurt and Christine and Daniel uh, showing up in our AI governance handbook that's coming out right now. There's a couple of other interesting examples like like theirs that you might find um, might find interesting in that handbook. But I, you're uh, the their example of kind of how that system was created really I think leans, leads nicely to thinking about rulemaking uh, versus guidance. But I was just wondering if you have any general thoughts about kind of even as you've defined it, thinking about discretion. Do you see that these tools? Um, are enabling discretion, or do you think it's more kind of taking away discretion from the individual decision makers? So I'd be curious, uh, any thoughts you have on that? And Bagarvi, I was, um, I really like the steamboat example as well, but I was also interested in maybe the limitations of it and just how much you've thought about that. There are some other chapters in this handbook where we talk about other potential general purpose technologies and how they might be um, good examples from history to think about how regulatory frameworks change and shift over time. And that this isn't completely new, but maybe there are some new things in this space. And I think the steamboat example goes some of the way in that direction, but uh, I'd be curious as to your thoughts on what some of the limitations are, because I think there are some 
important ones for drawing the analogies. So um, if you would like to respond to any of that, and uh, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the, the feedback. We'll definitely look into the literature you mentioned and try to draw on it more. Um, as for uh, an example of the kind that you were talking about, um, sorry, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm drawing a little bit of a blank because uh, I was distracted by the, the steamboat <laughs> question. I'm thinking about that. Uh, could you repeat the last part? <laughs> the question was, um, are these tools uh, giving discretion or taking it away? Oh, right, okay. Uh, so yeah, in terms of what we see uh, sort of on the ground, I mean, there's been a couple of very clear examples uh, in the news recently of it's taking discretion away. Uh, a good example of this is the Dutch um, benefits agency where an algorithm was predicting whether uh, a benefits claim was you know, fraudulent or not. And what they found was that civil servants, even though they were supposed to be paying attention, uh, were not and were just sort of rubber stamping what the algorithm uh, was saying. And so in those cases, you're definitely taking away discretion, right? Because um, they should have been paying attention and 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 making sure that the algorithm's recommendation sort of checks out. Um, uh, there's a, a great paper uh, about an Allegheny County study where there was a bug in the recommendation, right? And in that case, uh, some of the uh, you know humans in the loop were paying attention and and did correct uh, the mistakes. But um, so again, it comes down, you know not to like hearken on it more, but it comes down to these st structural aspects that drive one way or the other, uh, how much uh, you're getting this sort of complacency um, or you know automation bias or pressures to just comply. And so uh, I think you sort of see a little bit both ways, but uh, I think the reason that we, you know, wanted to write this paper and, and pursue a mechanism in existing law, uh, to is to prevent such harm that can occur uh, when you sort of uh, overly rely on an algorithm uh, in the way that happened in the uh, the benefits adjudication context in, in the Netherlands uh, and also happens in other cases. For example, the uh, ICE RCA algorithm, what happened was the officers weren't aware that the algorithm had been changed uh, and they continued to rely on it. And in one case, they explicitly said like, oh, I didn't even know that the algorithm was changed. Uh, I was just sort of following that recommendation. So uh, in that case, you know, that recommended no release to anybody uh, for bail hearings. And so that's sort of a situation where you, you want to start to question like, oh, wait, the algorithm hasn't been telling me to release anybody for the last you know month. Maybe I should. Uh, double check that. Um, and so I, I think these are the scenarios and why we want to try to uh, think about how existing law can help us prevent these, you know, very unfortunate circumstances. Yeah, just to add, I think there's some some really good conversation in, uh, in public administration in particular around these questions you might find. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, we'll definitely check it out. Yeah, thanks so thanks. much. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I think we're going to jump to this question because we're going to move to a wrap. Did you just have something quick? Like, well, yeah, um, quick, maybe we can follow up after. Yeah. I'd actually like to know what your thoughts are and what the limitations are. It'd be great to get uh, some feedback oh, on right. that as well. Thanks. Definitely. Yeah, let's talk. Thank you. I'm sorry, because he was asked about the limitations and I, I got distracted because we need to move here. Um, and that Dutch case is great. It's one of the things I write about in my, my book that's in the process. Yeah, too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sue Gluck from Microsoft, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of a counterpoint on standards and the standards making process. Um, I was involved with a couple of, um, it, with ISO, the International Standards Org, a couple of privacy standards, and I was co-editor of the privacy framework there. And um, in contrast to a different experience at W3C, I found, well, first of all, tons of government folks, NIST, uh, really ran the U.S. national body and people from other countries, a lot of government folks. Also, you had auditors, you know, because they want to help make the standards so they can audit against that, which is an interesting perspective, um, but also industry. But um, part of the, I, the ISO process is you submit comments, individual points 
sometimes hundreds of them, and then you have to read all of them that come from the different national bodies, um, which is a great way of getting everybody to prepare well and be on the same page when there are bad comments. We got some bad comments from the Article 29 Working Party on this privacy standard. Um, partially, it was a language problem. Partially, it was, I don't know. Um, I shouldn't talk about it live stream. But uh, <laughs> see, that's one of the problems, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was an intellectual um, effort that really people came together. It's slow, but I, it felt like a really fair process because it was balanced and you heard voices on multiple sides. So just saying, don't throw the standards baby out with the bathwater. No, that's that, that, that's a great point. There are some fantastic standards that are really important to put in place that are really helpful and things like that. It's just, it's it's a it's an inscrutable output sometimes, right? And from the outside, you're not totally sure exactly what happened. There's no records. There's no sort of like a, a, anything that I can go to to point to to sort of critique any particular standard that comes out because I don't know what happened there. I don't know why that standard is the way it is. And so you can critique it from the outside, but that's often much more difficult than being in the room and making the standard at the time. And so, and I um, think it would be better if it were transparent, frankly. So, it, you know, yeah, I'm I'm with you. Okay, oh, great. Thank you for that. Mark, did you want to jump in to like the last point really quickly for one second, and then we're going to wrap? Yeah, I, do you want me to answer the limitations? Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, this is something that um, I would also love to discuss with my co-authors who unfortunately couldn't be here, but um, I think some one of the things to think about with any analogy is that um, it's not really perfect. It wasn't really intended to be like, this is the analogy for AI. Uh, that was never the intention because, um, of course, we're all kind of grasping at straws here trying to find some. So I want to just have a starting point, um, and I went back practically as far as I could. So. Um, Happy to introduce other analogies as well. Thanks. Great. Well, we've had an amazing panel. I think we're just going to change the world from here. So let's give them a hand and then we'll go out. Yeah, thank you so much. That was that was absolutely fantastic. Really appreciate you each. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to uh, do a quick wrap up here uh, of, of the this part of the conference that's in, in here. Uh, but the most important thing I'm going to tell you right now is that you have to check out the amazing posters. Uh, a lot of wonderful scholars from all over the world uh, have put together these, these great posters and they want to talk to you about their work. Um, and those posters will be um, available uh, right outside. And so try to hit everyone. I believe we have six in all. Um, and uh, I hope you can get a chance to see each and every one. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, actually, I will take just a moment if I may, just to tell you what the names of the posters are, okay, so in case something piques your interest. Um, the Japanese Characteristics of Corporate AI Ethical Principles, uh, the Legal Implications of Cybernetic Avatars and a Proposed Method of Authenticating Them, uh, Embedding Translation Ethics into Speech uh, Neural Prostheses, um, Towards Sharing Mindscapes, Cognitive Interfaces for Natural and Artificial Agents, our virtual lives and hybrid, hybrid companionship opportunities and challenges of shared experience and augmented in an augmented century, excuse me. And finally, um, recommendation algorithms and human uh, warranty. So please do check those out. They're going to be wonderful. A couple other logistical things I wanted to say are, um, first of all, um, there is going to be a couple of, of, of we robot like adjacent events. Uh, one today and one tomorrow that I'll announce. But the one today is that between 4.30 and 6, um, there is a happy hour that's been sponsored by Everyday Robots. Um, and so, uh, uh, which is a company, not like a bunch of Everyday Robots got together and had a happy hour. <laughs> um, and that's going to be at the place called Schultz's, which is just right there on the Ave. And uh, it's open to all of you, and you're very warmly welcome. So it's going to be between 4.30 uh, and 6. And then there is the actual We Robot conference drinks and dinner, the reception, which is going to be on the Mountaineering Club, which is the top of the graduate. All right. If you registered for that, you're all set. If you haven't, there may also still be spots available, and you can still go and try to register. There's a small fee for, for being able to do that. Uh, but it'll be a lot of fun, and I hope you can. Uh, last thing I just wanted to say is um, 
you know, thank you so much to our sponsors again, to Microsoft, Everyday Robots, the University of Miami, University of Ottawa, and of course, my own uh, lab is hosting you, the Tech Policy Lab with Tadayoshi Kono, who you heard from, and Batia Friedman, who hopefully we'll meet um, soon enough. Um, and then I want to do a quick thank you. I just, I've heard from many of you, and I, I mean, I, and I mean like a dozen of you, saying that you got your question answered by somebody on this staff, that, that things were well organized. I know there was some snafus around catering that wasn't really, uh, that wasn't anticipated, but I've just heard time and again from you that you've just had a, uh, a great experience with our staff. And so I just want to say our staff and students, they put enormous amount of effort into this and I'm going to name them and then I'm hoping we can clap for them and we can do it again tomorrow, okay? Um, and so at the lab, we have Alex Bolton and Anna Swan, and then we have the following students, Maria um, Angel, um, Maria Angel, Maria Angel, uh, my PhD candidate, uh, Nicholas Logler, Salt Hale, Andrew Rate, Andrew Shaw, and Jasmine May uh, Alindayu. Um, and so can we get a round of applause for them to the list? I think that'll go. Um, and then I also, of course, am, am, am deeply indebted to um, the program committee, uh, and I hope that people get a chance to meet um, these folks, but I'll just name them two really quick. Um, Howard Chizik, uh, Kate Darling, Michael Frumkin, uh, Meg Jones, Jason Miller, Robin Murphy, Laurel Reich, Bill Smart, Kristen Thomason, and uh, Ann Washington, who you just heard from. Uh, thank you so much for all the great effort that you all put in as well. Come find those folks, okay? All right, big round of applause for the program committee. Um, yeah, so hope to see you at some of the social events. Check out the posters, and thank you so much for a wonderful first day, everybody. Appreciate you.